good morning, everyone. Uh, I think, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get started if uh, it's okay with Anne. Can everyone hear me? Can you, can you raise your hand if you can hear me? Excellent, thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, it's an honor uh, to have you um, review the work today. Well, welcome back to Pratt. Uh, uh, I'd like to acknowledge our uh, uh, chair, uh, Erica Hendricks, and also our distinguished guests, uh, Ty Call, Ed Keller, Parsa Khalili, Elliot Ma uh, Maltby, Eric Moed, Zire Wang, Claire Weiss, and Daniel Willems. Uh, and I also want to uh, thank uh, my esteemed colleagues, Ann Nixon and Marty Wood, for putting up with me the past year and uh, giving me the opportunity to work with them. Uh, our degree project studio um, uh, is uh, called Transient Space Disputed Territories. And within the context of this studio and research seminar and design studio, we, we focus on spatial conditions of contingent site situations specific in relation to architectural practices and material production. Architecture as a form of design thinking is not just form itself or a singular object, but rather a questioning of space in relation to both local and global conditions, cultural, environmental, economic, geopolitical, and geophilosophical within a social context. Um, one of the two uh, wonderful projects uh, that are uh, being represented today are done by uh, Gunesh uh, Kurtulan and Ted Kritanai Pusitikomol. Uh, and it's called, It's Nice to Be Here. And before they start, uh, Anne, would you like to say a few words? You took the words out of my mouth for some, but um, in just the addition to that, um, as for some introduced, the initial um, framing was transit space and disputed territories. One thing I wanna say is um, change is inevitable. And um, these students in their own geophilosophical ways dealt with speculations about spaces or thinking through buildings. I think that Ted and Gunas can take it away now. Thank you, Anne. Thank you. So who's gonna share the screen? Uh, I'll be the one sharing the screen. Okay. Yeah. My kind reminder to keep the presentation uh, as brief as possible to allow for the maximum amount of feedback and input. Yeah. All right. So uh, my name is Ted, and uh, my colleague okay. Ganesh will be presenting you the project. It's nice to be here. So uh, the project is nice to be here seeks to propose a series of architectural instances along the East River shoreline, establishing both a literal and metaphorical stance towards the ever-changing state of New York City. Through cultural, historical, and philosophical investigations around the concept of transiency, we explored a multitude of ways in which relationships between permanence and impermanence can be found in architecture. In the larger scheme of things, the impermanence and change are both fundamental in growth of a city such as New York, with layers of history holding on to uh, holding on and actively forgetting. One of the first philosophers to have stressed the importance of impermanence, Heraclitus said in his theory of Pantare, no man steps in the same river twice. Ganesh, you can take it away. Water has long been the epitome of the change and sacredness. We have been influenced by the picturesque quality of the New York City water edge and the urge to stop and look, to create a visual pilgrimage that provides a new visual experience of the East River and New York City through the shift in horizon with alteration of water levels, both architecturally and naturally. Along the East River, we've chosen nine sites that inhabit the quality of passage of time, whether through the presence of, of uh, decayed ruins, such as the case for Stives and Cove, or the rapid construction of projects that radically transform the waterfront of Roosevelt Island, 
we've decided to locate our architectural propositions in these proposed sites in order to visually highlight these changes. Narrowing down our selection, we cho chose four sites that visually relate to each other while exhibiting different conditions of interaction with water. Each site is accompanied with a secondary program other than being a visual framing device, a program that responds to the needs of the East River, increasing its sustainability. Our four sites are Ed, Co Ed Koch Queensboro Bridge, Stuyvesant Cove Park, Bushwick Inlet, and Brooklyn Navy Yard Wallabout Channel. The architecture in each site connect to each other visually. So uh, the first of the four sites, the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, site, similar to the Ed, uh, sorry, at the first of the four sites is at Koch Queenbo uh, Queensboro Bridge. The main program of this architectural proposition is a series of meditative pathways that extends from the existing walkway into the river. Each pathway structure allows for the oyster farming to take place in order to utilize its natural filtering capabilities to clean the waterways nearby. The meditative chamber cut off from the rest of the project is only accessible via boat, allowing for space of solitude during low tide and a platform to view the city when the tide is high. This is done not only to highlight the transient nature of water, but also that of, uh, of the passage of time, as the project is allowed to decay and alter one's perception and interaction with the project. Stuyvesant Cove Park has an open view. From its existing condition, the site has the views of the Bushwick Inlet and the Ed Koch Queensboro Bridge. The architectural proposition in this site alters the existing walkway in the park, extending out into the water and above from the water, creating various experiences with the water levels and how one positions themselves according to the level of the water. The architecture carves into the land, creating spaces for sea meadows, increasing the biodiversity of the river. The architecture is aimed to create instances of pause in different durations through the path of reaching to the place where looking becomes the main activity of focus within the built space. The Brooklyn Navy Yard site, similar to the Ed Koch Bridge proposal, is also the extension of existing conditions of the pier. The singular approach to the site forces one to traverse through the long narrow meditative pathways, leading one into a viewing platform in the chamber at the end of the project. Large platforms accessible during low tide um, perform, um, perform as a site for localized biofouling and cultivation of seagrass as a way to mitigate water pollution in the area. Bushwick Inlet has a direct relationship with the Stuyvesant Cove Park. Existing park and programs are preserved with this architectural instance where the paths reach out to, to a suspended massing that is enclosed and descends down into the water. The two paths create a connection between the two places, which are the enclosed architecture and the amphitheater. The extrusions below the mass are mimicking the geometry of the oil tanks in the site, acting as a form of sea vents and water filtration. The East River is an integral part of the New York City. It not only defines the city in terms of borders, but also contributes to the iconic image of the city. A flowing water in the middle of the city is the ultimate representation of change, and it is a powerful reminder to the occupants of the city that always aims to be permanent. Just as the water cannot be segregated from the city, architecture also should not be separated from impermanence. And that is it. Thank, Thank you. you.
our distinguished guests do have access to the presentation, but if you do not mind uh, making the slides available, should anyone ask you to go to a specific page, that'd be great. Right? I, uh, I have a question for the team. Uh, in the site connection map, uh, one of the implications for me is that you actually might anticipate um, a community or an individual use of your sites over time such that uh, I or a group of people in the city would become aware that there's a linkage. Um, a formal vocabulary that um, um, and inter site interventions that link the different sites. Uh, and I'm curious because when you're talking about the, uh, the idea of um, not separating architecture from impermanence, one of the things that you imply to my mind is, is the uh, importance of a collective uh, acknowledgement and perception of a, a range of different horizons of time. Uh, you want the architecture to index that, you want it to be visible. Um, you do use an almost nothing vocabulary um, in a way formally, uh, the concrete interventions. Uh, and so it seems to me that you're making a, a fairly strong statement about what it means to uh, use architecture as a tool to provoke awareness. Um, and so I'm just curious if you, if you have a kind of, um, if you've imagined a user or a user group and the kind of collective sentiment that they might feel over time in experiencing your sites. Because I, I was telling myself a story as you were presenting, I was thinking, well, oh, well, what if I was living in the city and over a few years I discovered that there were other sites like this one that's my favorite that you've made. Um, and, uh, and I realized that there was a kind of a larger narrative that you as the designers had laid into the city. Um, and left as a kind of a, a puzzle for me to figure out. So I'm just wondering what you expect the outcome of your intervention to be on a person like any one of us who's looking at your project right now or someone over a 10 year period who encountered the site. Um, thank you for the beautiful presentation, by the way. Thank you. So um, in the long term, our project almost acts as um, a public park in a sense. So. Uh, the site itself or the project itself is 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 timeless. Like any occupants can can enter or exit our site, uh, similar to the way they you know utilize a, a public park, for instance, and how they you know, utilize that as you know their own personal space of solitude, of meditation, of of just gazing into the view, for example. The idea behind having a user-defined experience was because we are also thinking about the nature as the occupant, as well as the um, humans of New York City, basically. So uh, what we're, what, when we had the renders that are showing some decay and um, time, we were actually thinking about the even the global water rise, when these architectural instances might be flooded to a certain point where um, new occupants would be even birds or um, the uh, contributing to the biodiversity of the Easter where might be even um, plants or such organisms. So the way that we were seeing it is um, the way that architecture aims to be permanent for the, uh, for the humans, it should be also uh, relating back to which one is more permanent, nature or the human occupancy? Thank you. Um, maybe I can jump in. I think uh, I agree with, I'm gonna echo Ed. I think it's a very beautiful presentation. I have maybe some issues with what you chose to present in terms of what these episodes on the waterfront um, really do. I think first, you know, I was trying to take notes as to what the loose programming of each of them were. I think you would have been better served to just say that each of them are different forms of recording environmental change and that they're sites for people to both witness that change in real time, let's say, but also then provide 
I, I like the idea that there's some ocular connection between these things, that it reframes the city as, as a series of points that are curated by some unknown agent being you guys. Then I wonder if you could have been more explicit about that. It seems like everything ends up being somewhat of a broad viewing platform, but you know, one strategy could have been um, in the similar vein to Piranesi's um, Aventine Keyhole, right? Where it, it's about a moment of discovery and that there's a very prescribed series of architectural moves that the agency of the architect is really about framing the next moment in the city, and even if it's not so clear how that connection is made. Um, but then, you know, letting that be really the only function of the architecture, and then letting it also as the inhabitant to experience the environmental change. I think, you know, and I, I love the representational strategy. I mean, I'm a diehard black and white abstract poetic kind of person myself. But I think if the narrative is hinged on this idea of the environment, I would have imagined some time based media that shows what the project looks like in high tide and low tide and you know during a drought when it's overrun by uh, flora and fauna and to just see these things on a I'm sure diurnally there's not that much to say but seasonally it could be a really beautiful you know um, in the spring it's a totally different kind of inhabitation and the the person personal engagement is very different um, I think that could have served the narrative of your project um, a little bit with a little bit more um, uh, precision, let's say, given the conceptual narrative. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is um, Claire uh, Wise. And sorry for joining. I saw your whole presentation, but I joined a bit late. I was kind of wanted to just continue the conversation uh, Parsa was having about specificity and how does one situate what you want to be a communing, I would say, between the city and nature, between change, between adaptation that's timeless with the actual specifics of a site. And that's sort of where I go with, I think one thing that I would continue to pursue in your work is to understand the specifics of place more. So if you look at your four sites, right, one is actually the vestiges of a cove. But I would say that that language, uh, you know, the Stuyvesant Cove one, which is called Stuyvesant Cove, but the vestiges of what coveness means, you know, as opposed to the one right across, which is at the mouth of um, um, you know, what I think was more of a man-made condition, or at least it's a, a condition that, or, or to figure out what the, between the history, but the specifics of water widening and narrowing, as opposed to being on the edge of the Navy Yard or the hard seawall of the site that's across from Roosevelt Island, I feel like the specifics of the fact that the water is very fast, obviously in the East River, but how it scours and what it does to places, that means that the places you're making actually are gonna be changed very much, not only by rising sea level, but by actually the speed and, and ferociousness of this water, one of the fastest water bodies in the world and I feel like your understanding that it wasn't enough a part of conveying to us the elements of nature with the elements of architecture over time. And, but I, I do feel like it's a beautiful problem you've set up. And I just want to encourage you to, to think about the elements of change in nature, even if you're operating in a landscape architecture scale, it's really time, I think, that you have to, and the specifics of this, that you have to tell us more about in your projects. But it's really like, I mean, I think it's beautiful drawings. I really, but the drawings really made me want more in terms of what, you know, even if you have to rip paper to like, to operate on this a bit more to understand what is it that this thing that you put out there 
what's going to happen to it? What is going to happen to people on it? But in a, in a very immediate way, I think. Thank you. We start showing the, uh, the daily title changes in sections, but thank you for your comments. We definitely. Yeah, I think interestingly, enough, the tide's very important in New York, but it's not the tide necessarily only here. That's really the condition. It's like, it, it's really the fact that what we've done is change the East River, but we've made it even faster. It was already pretty fast, but we've made it so fast. And that, that um, actually affects everything beside it or in it, but it sets an opportunity to like putting a rock in a river that what you put in also can slow down the river and create, like in Stuyvesant Cove, if you put something in the right way, you might have a condition where behind it, it the water is slower and therefore more things live and grow over time. I mean, it's a, maybe I'll say something. It's a, it's a really beautiful um, project, um, amazingly speculative. Um, and I think, you know, some of the comments you're getting now, um, I think everyone's wanting a little bit more, uh, like more details, right? Like you, you propose this kind of beautiful project um, that uh, much like the, I would say like the High Line, it captures people's views um, and captures their own times and allows them to be um, still. But if you look at, you know, even your own references uh, from Robert Smithson's the Spiral Jetty, um, that there's, there's an idea of a material um, specificity that is embedded in, in the beginning of a project that has some notion that uh, you're going to propose a design that's pregnant with uh, possibilities, perhaps. And I look at, you know, you, you continue to look at uh, other artists, like, for instance, James Terrell. Um, he has a very precise detail that allows um, you to see something in a different way, but also um, it, it reframes uh, time in, in, in a particular way. So I think it, the project is, is amazing, um, but I'm left with, um, I want you to keep developing it. I wanna see you know, what, what are the details you know, that, that you develop and how can you um, design for uh, you know, something like decay you know, or for instance, something like rewilding. Um, you, know, you could propose something that's um, you know, sharp and kind of um, hard uh, and has a very particular um, uh, framing the city. But I wonder how you start to embed in it, um, you know, notions of uh, different types of progressions after the design is done. Um, so yeah, I wonder, and I would love for you to continue to, to develop those um, details because I think that's when it becomes really, really interesting. Um, and I think that's when you would get um, kind of people coming back and returning and seeing how it's changed. Um, and again, this, I think what's being suggested in many of the comments is that it could be something that you play out representationally, um, you know, in accompanied with some kind of pretty interesting details that you develop, uh, that taking in, into account the, you know, all the conditions of those sites and, and really like allow designs to, to think about time and think about rewilding and, and think about uh, decay. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful speculative project. Um, yeah, so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can just build on, on those awesome comments from Parsa and Claire and Danielle. Um, and Echo, first of all, wonderful representation. Um, Nice title too, by the way, a little presumptive, but I don't mind that. Um, I, I think I actually see a, a lot of language from, well, first of all, a big tent definition of architecture, which I appreciate, you know, you're really spanning landscape, um, public art, basically. And of course, many elemental things from architectural history. Um, namely, what comes to mind is um, Japanese architecture framing out landscapes. Um, but I would kind of echo um, the comments about narrative and specificity um, because 
I mean, I almost wish you chose one site. I think all these sites are really intriguing, but I almost wish you chose one site where things fall apart a little bit for me is when you look at the drawing where you've connected the four sites, you know, if you're standing on one of those sites, are you really able to see one of the other ones? I'm not so sure about that. So I think, you know, it's, it's almost, I'm thinking about things maybe on more of a granular level, right? Like um, you have a specific site, you want to frame out something specific. There's the materiality, um, which I, I also find it curious that you use concrete, which looks wonderful in all these drawings, but it's so monolithic, such a hard kind of material um, and actually withstands the test of time a lot better than a lot of other materials. Um, so I'm curious about like the kind of hard versus soft kind of paradigm and some of the more landscape um, and ecological things you're doing versus the very hardcore or concrete um, proposals, which are beautiful as mentioned, but just curious about the materiality. But I guess I'll, I'll wrap up by saying, I wonder how memory plays into this because you really are borrowing a lot from the language of monuments and memorials. I, I find like what really, um, especially the, I think, believe the first project you showed, the, the one in the Navy Yard, um, reminded me a lot about, of the Donny Caravani, uh, Walter Benjamin Memorial in, in Spain, where he basically makes this passage um, uh, on this cliff where Benjamin um, killed himself as he was escaping the Nazis. Um, and it just, it, it frames out um, the, the water, the fast moving water, um, and in this case, it's the sea, um, and, and kind of is this journey, right? So I'm, I'm wondering, kind of, again, if you, if you take each one of these sites and you really think about the specificity and the narrative of someone moving through it, um, I, I also would, would like more, but I think this is a really wonderful provocation. So bravo on that. Thank you. Thank you. And Ted and Ganesh, you can talk to the materiality because it's not just concrete, you know, perhaps isn't there something that you would add to that? Yeah, we have, um, we were actually adding more materials uh, in terms of um, how a person would be able to occupy some of the spaces uh, in each architectural instance and not being able to in a certain amount of time. But we were also, um, we also had material studies uh, prior to the completion of the design uh, that actually talked about the porosity of uh, certain types of concrete. And um, we were working on um, different versions of plaster casting with uh, implementation of uh, seaweed and seagrass uh, trying to be uh, growing out of it. Can, can, you, can, can you please switch that? These material studies were not, uh, unfortunately not completed due to COVID, but we were um, looking at the, um, how to implement a material that is as um, permanent as concrete and to somehow make it into a state that actually decays even faster and, and lets um, growth in, inside of it. I, I would add that um, your search in materials is so welcome because New York City has a palette of materials that designers are asked to use time and time again. And we as designers are always challenging those. Like, can we think of it differently? Can we add a new technology, a new material assembly? And so uh, the idea that you're searching as well is very helpful. Welcome, welcome to the club. Um, and also I would say that what you were able to capture in your project is the scale of landscape simultaneously with the scale of New York and its present detail. And that's extremely valuable. And you've done it through a minimal language, uh, which I, I personally find fascinating. Um, landscape architects that I work with on projects always tell me, Karen, everything happens from the knee down in terms of scale. And I, I always remember that. It's sort of resonant whenever I sit down to, to look at a project's beginnings, certainly one located in the city. Um, I think if you were able to go back and look from the, 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 the shore to land transition from the scale and experience of the pedestrian, that would be where you could locate this material study uh, and a sense of material cultural challenge very specifically, and even more so from the knee down, start there. You don't have to take on 
the full scale of architecture and landscape simultaneously, but think in a very localized condition to begin to test and build your palette and your details against that selected palette, however you're developing it. So that would be, I, Claire said, talking about throwing a rock into the East River, as an educator, I would say if I was able to throw a, a stone into a wishing well, that would be my wish for you guys to be able to uh, continue in that way um, and continue this wonderful path that you're on. Um, because I think you've opened up some very important avenues of discovery and research that would benefit all of us. So on that score, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to jump in, um, if I may. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say, well, first of all, I just want to echo everything you've heard in terms of, uh, I, uh, I really think this is a super interesting project and I, I don't think I've heard a single thing that I disagree with. I, and just to maybe piggyback on some of the previous comments regarding specificity, you know, one way to think about that is to think about these different <clears throat> elements uh, that various people have brought up. But I also think you can, in a way, zoom out a little bit and sharpen the critical question that you're dealing with, which is this is the intersection between nature and culture, between the city and the ecology. I, I think one way I would think about this in a way to sort of deepen your project is to see if you can identify the points and this in a way this I'm, I'm here now piggybacking I think on what Claire was suggesting right is to, is to think a little bit about the points where um, the city and the ecology really are in conflict in other words you you sort of assume the kind of harmony idea which is wonderful and great and necessary and the ecological framework is important but at some point along the continuum in the relationship between culture and nature, there is conflict. And you are cutting into the landscape, you are, um, you are um, modifying it, you are changing it. And I, I, I understand the linear beauty in way with which you're working with is meant in a way to both accentuate it, bring it forward, work with the level of the, the water and so on. But I, I also wonder if the, issue can't be more uh, localized around notions of around where specifically the actual conflict, where in a way culture has to assume priority and in what way, where does that dynamic and that play between nature and culture in a way favor one over the other, if you will, if you see what I'm saying, it's not a, it's not a neutral ground where they're both kind of relating in some abstract kind of equality, right? It's not a political condition in that regard. It is a situation where, and maybe one way to think about the specificity issue is to how to really clarify those points. Like, what are they? Are there, how many are there? Is it happening everywhere or does it happen only in a couple of places? I think that um, seawall that Claire was talking about was one such example. Anyway, I'll stop there. I, I just I want to follow I, I just, up. On, I want to follow up on uh, on that. I think that's a that's a really good point. I, I think if your project were if this was to be midterm, I think one fruitful way of moving forward would be to expand your choice in site. And I I think the project could act um, kind of diagnostically in terms of man and the city's engagement with nature in a more specific way, and maybe a way towards that specificity is broadening your sites to be um, dispersed more broadly across the coastlines of New York City to really engage with different ecological moments. I think everybody, and I'm not a landscape architect and I could be wrong, but my suspicion is that New York is vast enough that from the Rockaways to the Bronx, the water conditions are different and the kinds of activities on a biochemical level are probably quite different. So your project could act as a litmus test dispersed across multiple sites to, you know, be diagnostic of the water and ecological conditions of New York at a glance at a moment in time. I think that would probably push you away from 
this kind of poetic visual connectivity, depending on how many sites you got. But I think that the, the idea of site as a matrix for you could be beneficial. And I think it could push you towards that specificity. And also coming back to the kind of programming, enlarging your public, so to speak, too. I mean, right now, East River, Williamsburg, Bushwick, Co what it's kind of the same groups of people who may use your project. But I imagine if it's in Sunset Park and if it's on the Upper West, it, it could just diversify um, both the people and the ecological experiment that the architecture is uh, a host to. So I think that could be a, a pretty fruitful way of moving the project forward in, for yourselves at least. Parsa, yeah, just to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ed. Parsa, I, I just wanna follow up on that because I thought that that was a very interesting way also of meditating on who the project is for, you know, in, in a sense, um, I, I thought Karen's point about the landscape architect observing that from the knees down, the body encounters a site. I'm, I'm Karen, I hope I'm, I'm capturing what you meant correctly. Um, so designing a site, you, you design it for the, the, the eyes that are floating, you know, five or six feet above the site and you design it for the feet which are navigating the site down below. And they're, they're both linked through the same body of a person walking or an animal walking, but they're two different clients. And so your, your design is for two different constituencies. Uh, and it feels to me like um, parts of the comment that you're making there, uh, for me connects back to the question of, of what access to different temporal horizons are we talking about? Uh, and in the ecological frameworks, there are a series of nested temporal horizons across everything from seconds all the way up to hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, and for humans, uh, we only have access to roughly a century in an individual lifetime, um, but collectively also across thousands of years. Uh, and so I, I'm really interested in how the project sets up a, a kind of a model itself for each constituency and what you expect the constituency to perceive or realize, uh, you know, in the course of experiencing the site uh, and experiencing your your uh, your kind of engagement with the site. Uh, when I say model, I mean, do you do you feel like the the project is for humans um, and nature, but mostly for humans? Is it giving humans access to these different kind of temporal horizons? Or is it for humans and for the river and for the ecosystems of the river? And if you're designing it for the ecosystem of the river, do you have a kind of a preservationist approach? Or is it enough to just say, we need to make humans aware of these different time horizons, of the life of the city, the life of the river, the life, the, geo, the, the kind of geophilosophical um, 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 speculations that Anne mentioned in the beginning? Uh, or are you actually intervening like, are you changing the destiny? And I feel like that's one of Claire's points was really, um, really uh, ev evocative for me. Even if you drop a small rock in a river, you change the flow around everything. And then you can provoke a kind of a meander over a long period of time if the rock stays there, um, which ultimately changes the destiny of everything. It's like the reintroduction of wolves, I think in Yellowstone some years ago. You know, within just a few years, the, the entire riparian landscape was completely different because the wolves changed the way that every creature lived, uh, the way that every creature used the landscape. And so there was this kind of cascading effect that was profound, you know, and maybe that's the comment about detail that, uh, of the site that I, I think I would, I would second um, that other uh, reviewers have, have made. Maybe a way of reading the site um, is finding a channel, a, a series of pathways in your own design work where you can take those details of the site and cascade them back through the entire project. Um, so, you know, when you look at flow in the kind of Da Vincian sense, you know, you see the turbulence and the cascades, and that gives you a kind of a formal vocabulary. Uh, but then what happens is at the edge of the river, because of the change in flow, the ecosystem changes. And then it changes in a week, it changes in a month, it changes in a decade. And if you have a toolkit, which allows you to then channel the week, the month, the decade, cascade effects back into your project. You show that in the decay of the concrete. And I thought that was very interesting. And there was a kind of a poesis there, which was like, okay, well, humans over time will recognize the decay and they will become made aware of the passage of time. Um, and I feel like that's, that's really beautiful. I was also thinking of Scarpa and the way that Scarpa dealt with that in Castle Vecchio. I mean, how do you underscore the passage of time so that you make it visible to the 
person who encounters it, but you also reframe the way that you perceive the passage of time. Um, and I feel like that's the, the, your choice as an architect in, in terms of the vocabulary through which you accomplish that is, is one question. But then again, to, to echo Parse's comment and, and, and Karen's and Claire's, you know, I, I feel like the, um, the model of what you want the outcome to be, is it just perception? Or are you literally changing the ecosystem somehow? And if you are literally changing the ecosystem, then I guess that's where I would want you to sort of make a, um, a claim, maybe a, a more um, kind of stronger, outrageous claim, like we are changing the ecosystem. It's like what we see in really good climate fiction these days, the work of people like Jeff Vandermeer um, in, the, uh, in the Southern Reach trilogy, and in, uh, which was adapted into the film Annihilation. Uh, what does it mean to really think about the relationship of the human to the natural and to not only flip it, but to fold it through and through and through in this kind of, I think they called it refractions in the film adaptation, you know, cascading through and through and through, what's the consequence there? You know, so I feel like um, imagining the city after your project had been in place for 25 or 50 years would be a really, really beautiful, uh, a really beautiful post-project project, if you know what I mean. But again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like the post-project project. Can't we all learn from that? <laughs> That's a terrific comment. Yeah, and to build on that, I mean, I think, you know, you, you guys have set up such a, a wide range of questions and I think that's beautiful. That's what a thesis should do, right? Gives you so many things to explore in your future uh, careers, whichever directions they may take, whichever pathways they may take, so to speak. Um, but I wanna get back to the horizons comment and, and kind of thinking about maybe your site as the city writ large, because New York, I mean, if you really look into the, the history and, um, and think about the way that the city developed and areas that are still areas that deal a lot or that, that are rather untouched, like for instance, like Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge, which could have been the place where actually all of the shipping came into New York, the port of call, which ended up being Newark, right? But if Robert Moses decided it was gonna be, they were looking at that as a site in Jamaica Bay near JFK airport, it could have been that. And that could have completely altered the ecology and development of the city. Um, and speaking of that area of the city, I mean, there's Floyd Bennett, Bennett Airfield, there's Fort Tilden. I mean, I'm not sure, especially with COVID, how much you guys were able to really get out of the studio and explore the city, but I really love the comments that were given about really expanding your notion of the site as the city um, and, and thinking about areas that have already kind of decayed and, and already um, been going through these processes. And what it'd be really interesting to see what you can learn from those sites and maybe bring them kind of into these other neighborhoods. Um, again, to echo what Parse was saying and thinking about the horizons maybe as uh, socioeconomic horizons, right? Like how, how do you take these precious moments um, and, and give people a place for respite and pause and reflection, but really thinking about these as nodes all over the city, all five boroughs, right? So if you're gonna have four or five sites, you're not to be too didactic, but maybe think about them in, in each of the boroughs, even Staten Island, right? So um, I, I think it's just a really interesting thing to think about the city as site for you guys and, and really expand all the notions that you're exploring. And, and again, bravo for bringing up so many great questions for us. I, I do wanna just, um kind of uh, support the, the four sites that um, you guys did choose. Because, you know, when you think about New York City, it's kind of a microcosm too. And I, I just feel like each of those sites has a completely different profile and relationship of a man-made structure to the water. They are deliberately, I think, even though maybe you didn't present it this way, you can all, if you can't see them, you can almost see them. It's sort of like ferry stops in New York, right? You anticipate them. And I feel like for that reason, you're kind of really pushing the architectural scale without going into regional planning. Like you're, I feel like there's some kernel of real kind of insight in what's the farthest you can push a site and still feel, make it feel connected. And I, you know, may, you didn't necessarily nail that in terms of presenting it, but I feel like it's there. 
And I also feel like, um, you know, it's really important sometimes, even if the place happens to be the East River, I think you, part of it that would have been great on your material studies is to have actually taken them and found a way to, you know, whether you're putting them in a bathtub and running what, but like to actually understand how they could work in a larger water body and think scale and just think about the interaction between, because um, the East River is in fact, one of the deadest rivers uh, we have. It's like, it goes through a yearly die off. The idea of using architecture to find a way to make um, support natural systems that want to grow anyways, but we essentially prevent them from doing so, is a sort of interesting idea for the larger field, which is, you know, we show green buildings, we show terraces, but like, do we really talk about actually architecture playing the role in being a crutch until nature can take off? And like, how do we make that bridge? And I think that's one of the deeper questions that is for me, I keep looking at it going, okay, we've invented band-aids and we know what splints are like, you know, some of the language you're doing, I feels to me like the, the um, you know, what's the term we used like five or six years ago, um, para, like it's a para, a para condition, right? It's like the, how are we making that condition it is not meant to be permanent, but it's a bridge to another. Or not permanent for thousands of years, maybe permanent for 50 years. Thank you, Claire. Uh, in the interest of time and to be able to give our distinguished guests some time uh, to uh, rest before the next review, which is in less than 10 minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to start by thanking every single one of you for the wonderful uh, comments, constructive uh, feedback that you provided today. Uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, Gunesh and Ted. Uh, you beautifully uh, showed us how a partnership could be manifested at a degree project level. I think once you uh, you went uh, cahoots uh, at the beginning of spring, uh, you know, I, although you know the, the, the thematical aspects of your project in the fall might have been a bit at odds, but you know, you uh, beautifully came together, and this uh, alchemy this uh, this past semester was just uh, wonderful to watch. Uh, I want to congratulate you both uh, on the hard work. I also want to again extend my sincere gratitude to Ann Nixon and Marty Wood for everything uh, they've done for for you and the Degree Project Studio. Uh, and I want to thank uh, every single one of you in this studio, especially you and uh, Ted and Gunesh, for the opportunity to work with you this past year. It's been an honor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So we will uh, stay here on the same link uh, and uh, the next group uh, will start at uh, 11 o'clock. And that would be uh, Professors Catherine Dwyer and Evan Tribus' studio along with Alex Deleuze, uh, and at 11 o'clock. Thank you, everyone. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Are we recording? It's okay. I, I think uh, we we will just stay here on this one for the. Hi, you two. It's Catherine. Hi, Catherine. <laughs> nice project. I enjoyed that. Thank yeah. you. Catherine. <clears throat> It's very this, weird. This day is usually so stressful and it doesn't it doesn't feel that stressful right now, although the tech is working. Catherine, are you in your pajamas? Uh, I'm not. <laughs> My husband has got that cornered. I mean, I you know, I've been actually wearing clothes every day, but <laughs> he is wearing long johns. <laughs> he, he slid from a turtleneck into a hoodie like <laughs> put on my video here oops yep so Catherine you'll be ready just in case yesterday 
I did have a Wi-Fi outage, you know, for a little bit that I rebooted from, but um, just in case anything goes. Um, that was very smart that you sent yeah. out that invite. Um, Evan, Evan and I should be able to, I also in Hudson, we, we, our Wi-Fi can be a little funky here. So yeah. hopefully Evan, there I he can, is. Uh, yeah, I'll, hi. Hi, Karen. Hi, Ann. Hey. Um, I love how Karen still has her hat, like, sitting there. Like, you're not wearing it, but I can see it. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> my bike riding hat. Is it? Oh, there I love is. it. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Um, yeah, Catherine, I'll take care of it this afternoon. So I think it should be fine. Um, I had, like, one minor glitch yesterday, but generally it's it's been pretty seamless so our wi-fi was i'm just saying it was really bad yesterday um to the point where like i couldn't open mails it was really uh, yeah. kind of weird but a ann is saying like if if her connection fails like we can step in because and you sent us that um the link right hopefully that doesn't happen though yeah and i did the same for, I, I made other folks co-hosts um for hours Catherine. For D. Um, not only are we recording, Anne, but we're apparently live on YouTube. <laughs> oh, hi, people. <laughs> yeah. Hello, world. Mm -hmm. So it's cold in New York. Is that, I see, Karen, you've got your. I'm wearing a coat um, inside. I'm in, yeah. I'm in Pennsylvania, our north of Philadelphia. And it's yeah. freezing here. Yeah. We've been having fires in the fireplace every night. Oh, wow. It's kind of weird. It is weird. It's freezing here too. And it's making me bananas because I just want to be gardening. And I'm worried about all the little things coming up right now. They look, you and know, these cute okay. little pansies and they're just waiting to be planted, but I have to keep bringing them into house. Right. Well, even pan, they can take more cold than most. It's true. They're, they're, but still, they, we have a hard freeze, so yeah. they don't do well with a hard freeze. They're no hard, hard but not that hardy. Yeah. Pardon me, everyone. I know we haven't uh, divulged nuclear codes or anything like that, but I just want to remind you that we're being recorded live on YouTube. Uh, you know, so far, so good. Nothing. Just wanted to, like, remind you. Also, uh, Catherine <laughs> and Evan, uh, I, in the interest of time, I didn't get a chance to uh, one by one introduce our distinguished guests that are invited. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you would like to really quickly go over their names and make brief introductions, I'm happy to do that with you because some of them I know, some of them you might know. Uh, um, yeah, I don't, I mean, typically I would have a list of people and names. I don't know who's on here. Well, I think that it was, we would let folks introduce themselves. No Absolutely, idea. we can have them introduce themselves, yes. Yeah. yeah, I think that's fine. Um, I mean, obviously, Ed, Danielle, Claire, uh, Weiss, I, I've been meeting on, on uh, the circuit of reviews in the past week. It's so wild. And Cass, I have met at this day in the past <laughs> um, at Pratt. I remember being very happy with Cass's comments on a project in the past. <laughs> Happy to see you again here, Cass. It's actually Ty, correct? Is it? You're using someone else's account, Cass. Uh, Ty, right? <laughs> oh, it's Ty. See, I don't even know. I just know the face. Yes. Nice to see you. Yeah, Ty Call, uh, Ed Keller, Parsa Halide, Elliot uh, Malby, who's uh, a professor in uh, GAUD, uh, Eric Moen, uh, Pratt alum, Zire, Pratt alum, uh, former student of uh, Ann Nixon, uh, Claire Weiss, and Danielle Willems. Yes. I guess most importantly, oh, there are students. Okay, Gabby, you, you guys are on? Okay. Yeah, they're here. And. We have a couple minutes still. Yeah. Um, J Jason reminded us that he did send the credentials of the um, of the critics, uh, so we could we could just okay. read it. <laughs> yeah, I can find it. I, there's a lot of material he sent us, so. 
Um, let me see if I can. Not that. Schedule. It's a lot of logistics, for certainly for. That one. All right, well, um, why don't we start in on that just to take some time. I, I don't know if everyone's back yet. Um, Catherine, where'd you go? <laughs> oh, did I leave? No, oh, I'm here, sorry. Okay. Um, um, yeah, I mean, Maybe we'll just make it easier and just read off uh, people's credentials from um, from what Jason said around. I, I have it in front of me. If you want me to do that, Catherine. Okay. Yeah, I did not find those credentials. So, okay. or we could just have people introduce themselves. Uh, I could sure. Let's just do that. I guess it's quick enough. Um, wh let's see. Uh, Ty, do you want to start? You're on mute. Yeah, we're asking all the critics to just quickly introduce themselves so we have a sense of who you are um, before we move into the next project. Okay, Evan, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, the name is Ty Call, um, Senior Associate at Perkins Eastman, um, graduate of Pratt from years ago, um, with uh, fond memories of Theo David, um, I have uh, participated in several of the end of year juries. Um, uh, Evan, I believe I was on your provocative Trump jury years ago. Oh uh, yeah, let's not talk about that. Uh, that <laughs> <laughs> Sounds scary. <laughs> where's, it, where's Ellie when you need him? Um, and um, I was on the jury last year with and let me use the slang terms, the marijuana plant, or the mar yeah, the ah, marijuana plant. Yes, yeah. yes, thank you, Ty. So that's one of the times I remember you being on a student project of mine, but you, I, I recall you were instrumental to that conversation turning the corner. So, it was so interesting because everybody was talking about a business model rather than architecture, mm -hmm. rather than the space. And I think that's what we're, that's why we're all here talking about space. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Let somebody else do the intros. Okay. So how about uh, Ed, why don't you uh, go next? Hi there. You guys doing intros? Yeah, yeah just a quick. You know. Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm sorry, I just jumped in from grabbing a coffee. Are we introducing ourselves? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Ed Keller. Hey, Catherine. Great to see you. Uh, I, uh, I direct the Center for Transformative Media at the New School, and I teach at Parsons in the School of Design Strategies. Great. Uh, Eric? Yeah. Hey, all. I'm Eric Moed, Pratt alum, former student of Evan. Actually, was in his studio a little while ago. Hey, Evan. That was uh, more than a little while ago. <laughs> a little bit. Not to date ourselves. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I, I recently graduated from the GSD in the um, art design and the public domain track in the master's in design studies. Um, my work spans architecture, public art and exhibitions and I have a multidisciplinary practice here in New York called OOPSA, Office of Open Practice Studio Agency. Nice. Danielle? Oh, hey everyone, nice to see you guys. Um, yeah, I teach at Pratt uh, in the graduate department and at the undergrad. I also teach at University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I taught thesis for or degree project uh, for two years. So I'm happy to see uh, the new developments. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Hello, Catherine and Evan. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Zaria. Oh, hi. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yi Rui Wang, and I'm also a Pratt graduate uh, some years ago. <laughs> um, I'm currently a researcher at uh, Princeton University, the Anger Center for Energy and Environment, and I'm also teaching at Penn. Thanks. Parsa? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Parsa Kalili. Um, I teach thesis with uh, Sylvia Levin and um, Liz Diller at the Princeton School of Architecture, and I have a small practice, Karp Kalili, in, based in Brooklyn. Claire? She might not be back. Go on, She's not back. She needs no introduction. Um, and then we have also um, obviously some of, some of our colleagues who are also teaching degree project, Karen Bousman, John Zott, um, Farzam, and Anne. And do we have any other colleagues who are on the call? Saul, Anton. Saul, Anton. And Hi, Alex Deleuze. Is Alex here? Alex so said he's watching on YouTube. Okay, so yes. Alex Deleuze is the, the writing instructor, HMS is the acronym, and Evan and I are the design um, professors for degree projects section called Future Publics, and this project is called uh, Invasive Publics and is set in San Francisco. Evan, do you want to um, say anything else about the studio? Um, just that... Uh... Catherine and I have been doing this for a couple of years. I think our meta theme thematic is the sort of disciplinary hybrid of landscape and architecture. Um, and I think specifically uh, the last couple of years, we've been looking at um, public space in a very broad sense of, of that, which has uh, clearly taken on a whole uh, new turn uh, given coronavirus and quarantine, et cetera. Um, at which, so uh, there have been some strange coincidences and things that students have been thinking about well before coronavirus that have sort of bore themselves out. So it's, it's, been a, it's been a strange year, strange and exciting and interesting year in that regard. Um, yes. And, um, and uh, yeah, I think that that's all we need to really say is to set these guys up. Um, okay. So Gabby so, and yeah. Yuyi, how about you take us away? Do I? You share screen? And I don't know if we there was a major a protocol indicator, but just I'm sure everyone knows by now. Just make sure you're muted while they're presenting. Thanks. Okay. So hi, I'm Gabby. I'm Yuyi. And welcome to our project Invasive Publics. So from our fall semester, we researched two precedents of urban public spaces, including Union Square in Manhattan and Fort Green Park in Brooklyn. Exploring these spaces, we found that communal activity was mostly driven by market systems and generic layouts. However, we believe that true public spaces should be active, radical, and overflowing in character. Today, San Francisco's urban fabric containing its financial district lacks identity and hinders social interaction. Predominantly gentrified by white and wealthy populations of the dot-com boom, Mainstream commercial and technological interests influenced the entire city of San Francisco. In the 1960s, hippie and free love movements fostered vibrant new attitudes of communal living, fashion, gay pride, and activism in the streets. Progressively, in the 80s and 90s, local establishments became hubs for art, music, and performative culture. Specifically, the radical theater movement oftentimes used public streets as a stage, which went against the homogenous layout of the city. So inspired by this history, we wanted to explore the following critical question. How can a counter fabric invade existing urban spaces to foster new kinds of social relationships? And how can these new social relationships drive people away from spectacle culture? So referring back to our fall research, after our visit to Fort Green Park, we used both sketch and notation to express its scenes of public space. And we found that much of public activity was influenced by its features of landscape, creating a reciprocal relationship between people and the ground, which later led into our research of rhizomes and plants and how their structures and behaviors can be applied to our own public space. Just as it continuously grows its roots underground to stay alive, we can begin to invent our own network system to create more multiplicity and activity. 
Another precedent we studied is Union Square. We were fascinated by how its plaza supports multiple programs at the same time, but we were also disappointed by the fact that it is a privately owned public space, which is many times restrictive and ex exclusive. From there, we studied virtual technology as a way to instill multiplicity into physical space, creating conceptual relationships with other spaces and provide various perceptions of a body. This diagram depicts the different ways that virtual technology distorts and dilutes the authenticity of the reality. So as our design hypothesis, we believe that combining typologies of landscape and technology can begin to excavate historical subcultures of the city, like its population of artists, homeless people, and skaters, and its ecology leveled by urbanism, including its sand dunes, streams, and terracing terrain, while also engaging new forms of mutual communication between different sites and local groups of people, both physically and virtually. We studied the historical theater and LGBTQ hubs from 1960s, which respectively represented the artistic vitality and cultural diversity of that era. Many of these cultural spots disappeared under the wave of gentrification, only a few remained. By studying the current city fabric, we figured that most of these historical cultural spots are adjacent to the neighborhood corridors that support small scale local businesses. So we chose two sites adjacent to these neighborhood commercial streets. One is the Castro Theater, which is located next to most of the LGBTQ centers and the Garfield Square, which is famous for its graffiti alley. And we also chose a counter site, the Transbay Terminal, located in the highly gentrified financial district. We can see from these three diagrams that the cultural spots have a small scale, low rise and dense fabric, consists of mainly housings and few streets of local restaurants, businesses and mixed use buildings. On the other hand, the corporate hub has a large scale, high rise and dense fabric, consists of mainly corporate buildings and transit centers. We also explored San Francisco's embedded geologic fabric shaped by its glaciers. And we found that most of its land was covered by dunescapes as seen in areas west to east and a hidden network of streams. And along the Eastern coast nearest to our three sites, areas of land were and still is occupied by artificial fill, as you can see here and in this next map. Um, and over time, we've noticed that most of the streams from 1850 have been covered up while cisterns underground represented in orange over here were created to supply the city's water instead. And as for San Francisco's other forms of infrastructure, its transportation systems like the trolley on Market Street begin to power the city's circulation more than the pedestrian. And we wish to change these things as potential areas of intervention for our project. Our new urban master plan of playscapes will become a hybridized and connected domain for virtual technology and artificial landscape to interact. We facilitate a rhizomatic spread to disrupt original orders of space and life in the city and excessively fill public space for maximum pedestrian activity. These are the three presidents that we looked into. El Campo de Cibada in Spain, the Instant City by Archigram, and the RSVP Cycle by Lawrence Halbrey. Specifically, the Instant City and RSVP Cycle are developed in the same cultural moments as the ones that we study in San Francisco, these precedents feature bottom-up interventions, temporary spaces, and event-based planning. Inspired by the RSVP cycle, we devised a planning project that acts as a scoring system, allowing the local communities to implement design on multiple scales, the city, the neighborhood, and street furniture. And these are some of our precedent readings from over the course of the semester. Specifically, we drew most of our inspiration from Critical Play by Mary Flanagan, which helped us recognize how forms of play, games, and situated experiences can be integrated with their own architecture in order to activate people in their different environments. So as a playscape, our project creates these interactive experiences through features of landscape, informal structure and props that emphasize the individual free perception and activate performance through artistic theft and communication. And we do this physically by invading different moments of San Francisco's urban fabric and excessively filling them within our sites. For example, Transbay takes over multiple blocks and crowded streets, Garfield Square adopts its urban alleyways, and Castro activates its hidden streams, natural corridors, and parking lots. And in this discursive collage, you can see that we're trying to create our extensive playscapes with new artificial landscapes, like daylighting its streams and growing new vegetation for our programs and integrating it with the existing infrastructure as we um, 
reprogram its irrigation indicated by these dashed lines under here, as well as the Wi-Fi systems above to suit our needs. In order for the to be flexible, adaptable, and invasive, we experimented with fabrics and scaffold structure. These structures express the kind of provisionality. They can be easily installed, aggregated, and rearranged by the local people. We are really proposing a participatory democracy where people are able to engage in the construction of the public space according to their collective needs. From these study models, we learned that there are tectonic moments that need to be set up to support the other flexible and expensive parts. In this urban map, we're installing plugs in pairs. So as we see, each blue plug that is adjacent to the neighborhood corridors is connected virtually with the orange plug that locates in a relatively gentrified area, aiming to encourage the virtual transmission of cultural life. The firewall that surrounds the financial district creates a barrier to prevent tech companies from intervening the local network system. These plugs blend various ground moves and virtual technologies to alter and multiply the way that one is able to perceive the ground and another body, thus generating new modes of communication and interaction. These plugs create a reciprocal relationship between sites. The weight, occupancy, and activity happening on one side will result in changes of the physical space, temperature, or creating a virtual projection in the corresponding site. For example, we are creating an irrigation system from the daylight streams to create a water figure of a person from another site. We also create a sand dunes that changes its form by blowing wind in different directions. We designed five major programs. All of them aim to stimulate non-hierarchical creative processes and collaboration between occupants to establish a new urban consciousness that allows leeways for interpretation, improvisation, and a rebellious behavior. The public kitchen allows people to grow and enjoy their own food products. The starting bubble creates a meditative and resting area. Both of these programs encourages a communal living and are inclusive to homeless people. The Manhattan Pool aims to est establish virtual communications between people of different culture. And the Sandbox excavates the geologies of San Francisco, welcoming people to express themselves physically and also allow artists to test out their visions. These are the general layouts and major elements of the five programs. Darker lines and hatches indicate the permanent installed um, structures, while the lighter ones suggest possible arrangement of the temporary structures, props, furniture, and vegetation. And in this plant series, you can see how Trans Bay has expanded from a single block and uses our public kitchen's dining track as a rhizomatic logic to connect to our other programs, which contain each other. In addition to new pedestrian paths that surround Facebook and link access to various moments on the street and back into our playscape. For example, we open activities to, to smaller cultural points surrounded by corporate businesses like the residential corridor and this corridor here leading to the University of San Francisco. This site, the Garfield School, is famous for the murals on the Bomi Alley that began in the mid 80s. Today, this alley contains murals on a myriad of styles and subjects from human right to local gentrification. As an extension of this alley, we created a mural wall that weaves in and out of our intervention and connects to the existing building and alleyways in multiple points. And in Castro, we daylight the stream of Royal Dolores indicated by the dashed line over here as another logic to link spaces from Market Street and its trolley into corridors such as Castro Street and interstitial yards that open access to the Castro Theater's parking lot. Within this plan of the trans -based site, areas highlighted in blue express moments of water usage. We also indicate relationships between the permanent and temporal DIY structures we build for each program. Line work for permanent structures are shown in black like the revolving dining track and exposed frameworks to support semi-enclosures and tech from the public kitchen and manhunt pool. Meanwhile, temporal structures, props, and vegetation are lighter in color, and such as the sleeping pods of the starting bubble and movable landscapes of the sandbox. This is the plan for the elevated public kitchen. We can see that uh, the dining track is on the ground floor, and the second floor is for cooking stations. And from the rooftop plan, uh, we see the space below, below is covered partially by fabrics and partially by trellises. 
The structure from the dining track transforms its framework and become the rooftop for Manhattan Pool, and it further expands to cover the public kitchen and terrace area. In this section show the atmosphere space is activated over time as people use the Manhattan Pool connected to the dining track and terrace above, while below people also occupy areas of the public kitchen and performance spaces created on the tracks under carriage. And in this plan series, the parking lot used by tech workers are automatically consumed by our playscape as they are led into the Manhunt pool containing our new interactive tech, including the water figure and temperature walls, which soon ramped them back up into the surface and explore the performative spaces and landscapes of the sandbox and the street, which can also be seen in this section in which we show how conditions of the ground are reflected to function in each program using natural resources to power social activity. For example, we illustrate the ground's organic material and dense layers of sand, as well as its embedded systems of water that we intercept from the water table and the city's cisterns and drainage pools that we create and redistribute that, them through our site's public kitchens and sandbox areas, such as the dunescape over here. In addition, the artificial fill is compromised by piles and retaining walls that contain their technology of their own to create multi-level interactive experiences for the occupants, which can now be seen in this section as joint spaces of the Manhunt pool and sandbox integrate with each other and as well as like the public kitchens hanging gardens. This is the dining <laughs> track that revolves around the family building. And as we move forward, we see the moving landscape that responds to the occupancy of another site. And people are able to hand hammocks on these structures. The colored line that we are seeing indicate the airflow that are generated from these temperature walls that creates invisible divisions in space. In the last area, we provide permanent tracks on top and grooves in the ground so people can build their DIY sleeping pods within this track system. In the Garfield Square, the new graffiti alley that we designed as the extension of the existing bombing alley wraps around one side of the football court. As it extends towards the south, it slowly ramps underground and connects to the basement of the clubhouse and eventually tunnels out from the skateway. In this section shows connections between Balmy Alley as it creates a graffiti wall that's carried over into our playscape to create a new public underground for artists and performers to interact. And moments of activity also expose themselves as, as reveals within the ground meet areas of the public kitchen that look back down into them and trail off to the other side near the manhunt pool and sunken stage. This bird's eye view is showing the public kitchen area. The permanent structures are showing a more saturated orange and the temporary structures that built off from these permanent structures are showing a lighter tone, which forms a temporary roof for picnic spaces. Along the public kitchen, we can see these DIY structures with wooden fabric where people can grow their food products. Moving forward, this is the staging area which is embedded within a terraforming garden. The performance of the artists will be recorded and live streamed in another site. This is the kidney pool for skaters which has a path that directly links to the graffiti alley in the ground. And these are the carved out moments where people can look down into the graffiti alley. So again, we recap that by daylighting and redirecting water from the hidden stream of Royal Dolores and Castro, we begin to leak and fill areas of Castro Street and Castro Theater's parking lot. So these maps show how the site can change its form and purpose as people activate areas at different times of day, rearranging props to supply their own stage and expand programs beyond their permanently installed locations for future events. For example, the stream is used by the Manhunt Pool in the sandbox for live stream concerts and communicating with other sites while the public kitchen is constantly changing as well as the starting bubble due to events in the Castro Theater itself and newcomers. And specifically the public kitchen is centered in the growing pond and in front of the theater but changes as people take advantage of adaptable trellises to grow food and other vegetables create more activity as well as pop-up stations for people to invent and try new recipes together. And these two perspectives capture the playscapes in action as the activity unfolds around them, allowing for an inclusive and participatory democracy to take over in future public space. 
On the left, the Castro Theater instantly becomes the backstage for the drag scene performers and artists as they can be watched from the public kitchen's growing pond and surrounding garden spaces of other programs, which can further be accessed from both the west and north corridors, which leads into this image on the right, showing how audiences begin to intermingle as they are guided out corridors that we create by the stream that takes on different forms and creates more forms of pedestrian activity at street level and specifically around Market Street's trolley line in the foreground and back into Castro Street's neighborhood in the background containing its multiple nightclubs and restaurants. In this video, we can see that there are multiple programs such as the sandbox and the public kitchen alongside the stream. From the street level, people can go down the terrace and interact with water. They can also watch the water figure, which serves as a projection for an actual person from another site. Our agenda here is to transform the homogenized public space in San Francisco into a place that embraces the diverse subcultures and geological conditions that historically exist there. With our network of playscapes, we are able to free public space as individuals can express themselves, allowing their identities to clash and influence each other. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, better. Well, I, I, I'll jump in quickly. I, that was an incredibly beautiful presentation. And um, obviously we could, we could spend a, a lot of time with it. Um, I had a few kind of questions generally to offer to you as comments and also um, to the to the other folks around the project today. I was wondering how models like um, Van Eyck's Playgrounds, which I'm sure you, you must have touched on or looked at a little bit, um, or temporary um, sites like Burning Man, and I'm not offering that as a positive example necessarily at all, um, or Constance New Babylon, um, function for you as kind of litmus tests uh, or the pilgrimage to Mecca um, or the Kumela festival, you know, how they function to you as litmus tests vis-a-vis -vis the socioeconomic consequences of what your project is trying to accomplish because you're, you're, um, you're offering an image of radical inclusivity and radical play. And of course, in the Van Eyck example, um, you, um, we assume that mostly good things happen in the playgrounds in Amsterdam that Van Eyck built. And I think probably we all would generally agree that they did something very important over a longer time frame in the city, like a decades time frame, to give multiple generations of children growing up in the city after the war a sense of like Place. extremely um, linked urban fabric um, and a respect for, for that sense of urban fabric, openness, play, minimal play, but yet multiple, multiple locations. And so the, the kind of building out of a, of a civic um, collective sense of play was, I, I think, obviously what Van Eyck was interested in, um, but also really interested in the longer arc effect of that. And that has um, structures of feeling effects, using Raymond Williams' term. Um, it has socioeconomic consequences, civic consequences. And the reason I'm looking at Van Eyck, even though you didn't mention Van Eyck, is because I think it's really hard to say that some bad stuff happened because of Van Eyck's project. And it was like playgrounds. We all as architects, uh, furniture designers, urbanists, landscape designers would look at the, that example and say, generally, good outcome. Not so much bad stuff happened there. But if you start looking a little bit more critically at um, in, at, in instant city, model and archogram model, we're looking even at Constance New Babylon as a model. You see that radical play means radical inclusivity means really some funky stuff can happen. Funky stuff meaning violence. 
um, and not just physical violence, but socioeconomic violence, like the problem of a privately owned public space and the implications thereof um, don't have to be limited by just, oh, well, here's a square and it's privately owned, but everyone can use it. But of course, the private owner can control that one spot because we see now that um, as you showed in one of your, your, in your discursive collage, we understand that the models of virtual um, power, virtual economies overlapping with physical and natural power and natural economies is extremely capillary. It's really, really interwoven and it's hard to untangle that. Uh, and so my meditation for you is to wonder what the limit of um, radical inclusivity is because I sense that if an emancipated and generally friendly and kind population encountered your project, they would be set free. We, we would be set free, you know, in the sense that a, a form of civic um, being would be encouraged, teased out, scored, uh, in the sense that you used Halpern's work, um, choreographed in, in the sense that you used Anna's Halpern's work as well. Um, but if um, anti-vaccine gun-wielding demonstrators were radically included, then the outcome would potentially be different. And actually, I, I personally don't think that the, although they're dangerous on a local level, I don't think the anti-vax gun-toting demonstrators are the biggest danger. I think that the capillary infiltrations of power uh, on every single level is the, is the larger danger. And so for me, this becomes a really interesting question. You know, in some of your um, fly-through renderings, which were gorgeous, not just because they were beautiful, but because they actually told me something about um, relations in the site, um, you had these fragments of stone and of course you had the water. And I, in your conclusion, um, the, the note that I wrote down was the stone on the site, the water on the site and the balance between permanence and impermanence, which of course was something that we talked about in the project we saw earlier. And for me, this, this goes back to the question of, of scoring that the Halprins dealt with. Um, and what Chumi has dealt with in his work, you know, how do you score a site such that you invite that improvisation that you, you so clearly want to invite, um, but you also build some kind of pushback into the site that pushes back, but doesn't discipline. You know, it doesn't say, no, here's the allowable range of behaviors in the site and here's the non-allowable ones um, because laws and social mores and police forces and military forces do that kind of pushback, you know? Um, so how do you offer a model of both radical inclusivity and yet something that resists that provokes a kind of an emergence of the civic. I, I'm not saying that you didn't do that in your project. I think you made it super, super clear that that's what you were trying to do in the project. Um, but I just offer some of these other examples because in the other examples um, that I mentioned in the precedents that you mentioned, each one has a slightly different model of what radical inclusivity or um, true civic space would be. Uh, and so it's, it's just, it's a beautiful project. It's really, um, uh, really evocative of these questions. I also thought of, of Panic Theater by uh, the projects in the 60s by Jodorowsky and Topor, the taking over public space. What does it mean to create a, a kind of a panic theater in public space? What does it mean to be terrified of the theatocracy the way that Plato was, um, which Samuel Weber talks about quite beautifully. Um, these are all really important questions that your project brings up for me. Uh, and I, I don't have a specific answer. I mean, I, I imagine um, the scoring, I imagine the scoring is one of the closest ways to approach it and the way that you um, adapted the scoring approach for the materials, furnitures, ecologies, natural systems, urban vocabularies that you did, that was very clear. Um, and so I side with you um, on that front. Nonetheless, I'm always frightened of what happens when we have radical inclusivity and we don't have the force that can stabilize the system. You know, unfortunately over history, the force that stabilizes the system is punitive laws, violence, uh, military and police uh, forces. Uh, and so my intuition is maybe there's a way that, uh, and this stems back to the 
all the way back into the 60s and panic theater up through the 70s, uh, maybe in a funny way, Christopher Alexander's pattern language, um, a funny way, um, maybe then through the 90s open source software movements up to today, and your um, in, intention to approach a high tech plus urban fabric plus ecology, plus scoring, plus gesture. Maybe there's some way that you can make a proposal that says we do have control systems in place, but the control systems are super adaptive and they're designed to make all of the users aware that they are in place in their control systems while at the same time not undermining themselves as control systems, yet while at the same time not turning into a disciplinary organ, uh, either of the city or a legal disciplinary organ. And so, you know, obviously humans haven't quite figured this out yet. I mean, we theorized it beautifully and we've made some stabs at, at building stuff like this, but we haven't quite figured it out. And so um, this is a very long meditation, so I apologize, um, but I just, I really, really appreciate what you've gone after in the project. It's very, very beautiful. And those are a series of parallel thoughts and relationship and doubts and questions and fears I have around what you've very clearly mapped out. Um, so again, I'm not questioning your project in any way. I think you mapped it out super, super, um, uh, with, with super clarity, um, but I just don't know where we can go. So I, I, I totally applaud your project for mapping that out in that way. Do you, do you have any response to these? These meditations? So actually for midterm and for final, like this was like a recurring thing that we had to think about like in terms of maintenance because um, we are tapping into infrastructures of the city but at the same time how to maintain it as like a true public space without so much restriction on the programs that we're creating. Um, and from that feedback it was more of to have the city be the sponsorship for the project so that way they can give us access to this without changing the way that we're creating the activities in the space because a lot of the times like when we research public space like in San Francisco there's a lot of like Paphos uh, privately owned public spaces and with that comes like restrictions of time and I, I know like also restrictions of safety so how can we create like a space that allows for this freedom without having so much of, I guess, like government intervention, but at the same time, having them like on board with the way that like this is a public space and offering it to the public would be something beneficial that they could be a part of. And then having like people in the community also being like volunteers to help like with the ways that like, for example, like the food kitchens and like, not exactly like funding, but in the way that these activities kind of bring people closer together, like how that can become more of like the cultural aspect of the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms of the site selection, um, uh, those three spots are uh, all adjacent to certain nonprofit organizations, for example, like the uh, San Francisco University, and there are some like um, churches like, pro that provide shelter for homeless people. So we are also like expecting the uh, cooperation between the city and these nonprofit organizations to support this sort kind of program. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. What I liked about it was the idea of bridging uh, and connection, not only connection in neighborhoods and so on, but also sectionally the idea of opening the geology above and exposing it to um, the streetscape and uh, allowing people the access to water and fountain which collects people. Um, the imagery I'm seeing, and once again, as Ed said, you know, beautifully displayed, you know, all these drawings and so on, um, and Ed raised a good point. The idea, and I think Ed raised it, the idea of Bernard Tashumi's La Villette, which created a structure, and how the play, the informality can happen outside of that structure, alongside of that structure. What I don't see here, and maybe I missed it, 
Was the idea of that formal structure, that that wall, that datum line, that organizes all of this. And maybe that's not what you were interested in because it's all radical play rather than a structured a structured design. Um, so to comment on that, we were trying oh. to express, like for example, in like the maps of like Trans Bay, Garfield Square, and Castro. So I'm like, hold on, let me just um, yeah. zoom in. Uh, one second. Great drawing. Um, so for Trans Bay, because we originally started off with this site and like seeing like one of our programs being like as more of like the dominant program to create like this rhizomatic logic to connect the other programs. So for Trans Bay, it was like this dining track. So in a way like that structure is something that we use as like a connection system to both sides of like the multiple blocks we were creating. Um, and then for Garfield Square, it's, it's like for both cultural sites of Garfield Square and um, Castro trying to find like bits of the actual um, area that we could like be inspired from. So for here, like how to carry off like the wall of like the graffiti alley as like something that could then feed back into the activities that we wanted for like, let's say the sandbox, like how that can become that rhizomatic logic mm -hmm. and how each each space has like its own like unique set of um, either pre-created spaces or hidden elements like in Castro, like the daylighted stream and how maybe like opening that up can then reinforce like what sort of structures that we were making to create like that um, connection. So I, I don't know if I answered the question. I guess, for us, you know, going back to one, you know, your previous graphics, go back to one or two slides. The, um, the plan moves or the, The graphics seem to be a little bit organic, seem to be very, very lack of structure. And I'd almost want to see a backbone or a skeleton that would allow these things to tie better together. I like the idea that each place has its, you know, a central purpose. I like the idea that they're connected not only horizontally, but vertically. And I almost would be um, suggesting a formal connection rather than, I don't see a formal, I don't see a formal connection between all these three places yet. And what did I miss? Yeah, I, I actually want to jump in here because I, I tend to agree. I think um, nobody, I think, can contend with Ed's superlatives of your project. This is remarkably comprehensive, and I think it's it's a testament to how hard you both have worked over the course of the semester and year. Um, I think there's too much happening on some level. And while I appreciate this idea of a guerrilla urbanism that's about really for me what I read is the subtext to your presentation a return of agency to a, a broader public and that there's a, an idea of self-governance that's tied to play and and ownership there's all of these very complex socio-cultural issues that are tied together with the very simple act of what simple in quotes act of a redefining play at the urban scale um, on some level, I guess that what I am, what I would echo in what um, Kai mentioned is I still, as the vision of the architect, I would expect some maybe ineffable superstructure that ties it all together, <laughs> right? Some, That's some, what way we of, <laughs> some way of reading that this is part of a system um, and that there is some level, I think on some level, you can't avoid hierarchy and I, and you, you guys put on the table so many interesting possibilities for a new definition of urban play. But I think, and maybe that's part of the, the ethos of the project is um, in the presentation that it's hard to read the hierarchy because it's about all of these kind of overlapping, sometimes contradictory moments of you know urban space. 
But I would imagine if you had a way of finding the lowest common denominator of what the architectural like uh, host would have to be that would enable all of these dimensions to what you're talking about. Um, and then I think I would challenge you to get really architectural and envision how you expect different publics with different expertises and handicaps and issues of access and uh, it, you know that all of the ADA requirements aside, but even just conceptually, how do you expect people to take their own, like, let's say the, their destiny into their own hands and build into the kind of public play that you're interested in? I think I would love to see some idea of how you guys put on the table, the kit of parts and the superstructure in whatever form that is, and how you imagine people coming together to define and a participatory guerrilla urban kind of model for play in the city today. And, and right. that may, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Parse and Ed, I have a question. Um, I think Gabby and Yui, is that, yeah. okay. Yui. Uh, they raised the idea of Archogram, Michael Webb, Peter Cook, and I think the term plug-in, um, was used previously. The, there is a system of putting objects down. Going back to Parsa's comment, there is no infrastructure to plug into. Am I correct? There's been no um, Uniform passageway, utility, graphic, umbilical cord um, that ties all these things together. However, it's going back to the idea of the radical play and maybe the idea of functionalism and that formalism that Parsa you talked about maybe that's totally negated with this, with the idea of creating a, um, a marketplace, you know, which even has a sort of order. Uh, I'm intrigued with this because of all the opportunities that are there. I'm intrigued with the ideas of connecting the neighborhoods. I'm intrigued with the ideas of connecting it vertically, horizontally. I'm intrigued with the idea of allowing the community to participate in the use of these neighborhoods and tying them together. I wanna to see much more of it tied together with a formal structure. I mean, maybe I can jump in there too. I mean, I love this, this comment about uh, agency. I think that's, that's a really kind of critical um, kind of point in the project. Um, and I, I think that's how you make a space like this, um, you know, and I think interacting or building a sense of agency within the community is, is kind of very important. So I wonder how uh, the, the kind of people that would use this space could also participate with its building or its uh, change or shifting, because I think ultimately um, you know, when you insert those parameters at the beginning, uh, knowing that it's not just uh, a top-down um, uh, architect coming and, and grafting their vision on a space, but, you know, your project uh, speaks a, a, a lot more about a sensitivity, you know, the, the placement of where you pick the sites, there's a lot of careful thought um, involved. Um, but I wonder how uh, design elements, you know, such like, like, a, like a lattice, um, that you incite people to come and participate in some way and, and, and gain some, um, some agency to the space. I think that's, that's perhaps where uh, you, you save yourself from it becoming uh, something dangerous. If, if, if people have ownership in some way, you know, they want to make it better, they want to kind of exchange um, ideas and information and data across it, um, you know, then, then you, you kind of uh, transgress some of the issues um, I think you have with this free space, uh, kind of um, free uh, play space. 
And I think about, you know, a lot of the questions now that are being answers, answered um, or kind of queried are, uh, what does it generate in the end? Because I think you can, you can look, um, you can uh, kind of self-build it backwards in a way. Um, and I, I wonder also in the beginning, you talked about uh, kind of the digital. So this, this notion of um, real-time feedback is also kind of interesting. And I wonder how you, you kind of build in um, a real-time feedback to these so that you do give even more agency to the people that would, would use this. Um, you know, I also think about Cedric Price and, you know, something like a generate the generator project where there is a larger kind of um, goal of what bringing um, these people together in, in a play space um, could give. Um, so I wonder kind of how you can, you could think about those parameters, um, you know, and how you build, you know, a little bit of design, but you know that design is about other people um, kind of uh, gaining and changing the space um, and kind of taking a little bit more um, ownership on it. Um, I'm always, you know, I, I go to this place in, in Greece every every summer and it's 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 the anarchist area in Athens. It's called Exarchia. Um, strangely enough, it's right right near the architecture school. Um, but they have these places where they've kind of grassroots come together, design something, and even in the midst of uh, you know crime and you know free whatever free whatever happens in these anarchist spaces um there's a there's a sense of um watching out for the the people and, and the place and the materials and uh, kind of a, a building of something better there too so it, it would be interesting to speculate uh what's the goal of this in the end um and how can you kind of um uh, think about that uh in a in a kind of um a flipped way to then uh, kind of be even more precise with some of these design elements. Uh, but it's, I gotta say, it's a beautifully represented project. And I think you definitely push some, uh, some boundaries, representational boundaries that are quite stunning. And even in, in the uh, kind of animations, I find those really beautiful. That could be a place that you explore these ideas even further. Um, you know, so I would, I would say keep, keep working on this project. It's, it's really beautiful. I guess what I wanted to add was that I really feel like you nailed the subject matter. You understand that fundamentally there has to be a way of, uh, that's why I really love this plug diagram one, that fundamentally you want to change how people look at inserting kind of moments of interaction into real spaces, right? So that you are denying that your audience is a two-year-old or an 82-year-old. You're basically saying, you're saying, look at a two-year-old and an 82-year-old should be able to interact in a play sense with all environments. At least that's what I'm getting from it. But I, I think, you know, back to Ed mentioning um, the Aldo Van Eyck playgrounds and you all being a, in a generation that has grown up with video games, digital technologies, animations, I feel like what we're all wanting you to do and looking for you to do is have fundamentally understand when you look at a precedent like those play spaces that they were enabling complex future games to happen by simply having a pole and drawing off center a circle, knowing that, that the kind of provocation of a asymmetry or, or a single piece of geometry was gonna be something to someone. And I feel like when I look at all of your drawings, I want to understand how you would do that in a temperature sensor, how you would do that in a moving landscape, how you would do that in a sand table. And, and fundamentally, the difference between an architectural position than a industrial design or other forms of design that might take this problem on. Because when I look at the sunken stage or the moving landscape or the dunes in this diagram, I go, well, that doesn't actually look like it's provoking interaction. It looks like you're gonna depend on the material itself, whether it's sand or whatever, 
to be, um, you know, very like one-on-one. -on -one. Here's the sand, I move it around. But don't you want to ask fundamental questions like what is sand made of or where does the water come from? Or I just feel like you have an opportunity with this unbelievable, the um, huge amount of work you did, an unbelievable methodology to kind of remove some of it and kind of demonstrate that there is a, you're post Aldo Van Eyck, but there is something about the virtual and the digital that have learned from each other that you put out there. So in a way, I feel like your project's fantastic, but it maybe this is what you work on for the next two years is trying to prove that there's a relevance to public space, to physical public space in light of our current digital public space, which we are occupying. Look at us right now. We're in a digital public space. You know, how do you make us play? And how, what, how relevant is that to your plugs, which I actually think are a huge infrastructure opportunity. So I love your project, but at the same time, I'm really challenged to say, okay, but did you solve it? Did you solve your, the kind of challenge of your generation fundamentally? <laughs> That's all. Yeah. <laughs> That's so you guys, you know, I just think that you're putting out there what is a really, maybe the crisis that we're heading into, right? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I would, I would add to that in the sense that it is a, a thesis question of importance and consequence. Absolutely. And my sense, you know, I, I don't want to speak to the specifics about the design strategies and so forth. I think that was done so well by the, the critics so far, but I just wanted to give you my, my feedback in that I have the sense that I'm uh, flying high in a, a Eames power of 10 cents over your thesis question and recalling uh, sort of cross-examining a, 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 a lawyer, a law practitioner client. And when you ask, when, when a lawyer says to an architect, what's well, architecture, you know, the air goes out of the room. So flip the script and say to a, an attorney or a lawyer, uh, a professional, what is law, it has the same effect. And when you press them, cross-examine them, uh, you get a response such as, well, um, it's collective conscience and self-conscious that collides with law. So therefore it is before law. And so I think about that in terms of the question you're putting on the table for all of us. How do these collective spaces uh, bring the consciousness, the self and the collective together that is before loss, before use, before you can and you can't, they will and they will not. And so in that sense, it is a fundamentally powerful uh, thesis question, as in I said, of tremendous importance and consequence. I also wanna thank your thesis professors for allowing you the space to develop this. Um, I'm sure there were some very fascinating conversations about what this entails, what it covers, where do you frame it, bracket it, where do you extend it? Um, it's, I think it was clear said, you know, continue. I would say, yes, absolutely continue, but it's for all of us to continue these ideas uh, as practitioners and those who are given the opportunity to work in this sphere of public place um, where we have to encounter so many modes of operating and, and, and uh, ethics, uh, deep and rich and very powerful. And yes, is it prescient for our times we're living in right now? Absolutely. Uh, it's something that will have re resonance for me personally, as I try to move forward as best as I can in the world I live in as a practitioner and an educator. So thank you. Yeah, I, I also just want to um, uh, first echo uh, a lot of the comments that has been brought before me, um, and also thinking back about the instant cities that you, know, you, you guys suggested an incredibly rich and uh, sort of exciting wealth of programs that are really injected into the city as means to make changes. But at the same time, thinking about back on the instant city examples, what are the longevity of these spaces? What are the sort of the 
the ramifications of actually deploying these kind of plugins or instances of um, interaction you're trying to facilitate. Um, one, one aspect of the project I thought was, I think it's pointing towards, I think a little bit, I, uh, is that the fact that I think it's the relationship between our bodies and cities. So in that sense, I'm kind of, I'm recalling kind of the final hypothesis by this uh, feminist uh, theorist called Elizabeth Grove, where she was saying that, you know, the degree we're changing our cities is only be, would only be possible if we forecast a new relationship of the degrees that are we relate to bodies, right? Not only our own bodies, but also other bodies or non-human bodies. So I'm curious that, you know, from your proposal, whether that's programmatically or socially, how body is being perceived, how body is being animated, um, how is body being sort of uh, forecasted or sort of modified even? I think it's a, I, th I think it's a, I think it's an important question to, to, to contemplate upon. And I guess one of the instances that really sort of excite me on that note is that the moment you start to use sort of temperatures or in your, uh, or climate as a way to spatially uh, whether divide or, or to augment a new sort of bodily relationship, it seems that there is something there because we all perceive um, temperatures or humidities or heat differently. So I'm curious that, you know, with that as sort of a, as a setup, how, how body is it able to sort of respond to these conditions, both uh, sort of physically, but also socially and politically uh, would be something to uh, contemplate upon. Well, thank but, you, um, Sarah. We're gonna have to bring this to a close. Um, I have a feeling this conversation could go on for quite a while. Um, and I just wanna, I, I wanna thank our jurors for engaging with this really incredibly intricate work. Um, and um, I wanna congratulate Gabby and Yu Yi for being absolutely a delight. Um, they are as much philosophers as they are designers. Those two things rarely come together in this manner um, and that we're, we're experiencing the um, the, the manifestation of that. And it's, it's as, as was pointed out, Saul, thank you for your very um, big compliment at the outset. That's one of the um, best, project, best presentations you've seen. Um, it's a true degree project. So thank you for your investment in, in all of this work. Evan, Alex, uh, you wanna? I did, you know, we, we, should, we should move on, but I, yep. I just wanted to echo that last point. I think that there's a big difference between a project and a degree project, and the degree project doesn't actually answer the, prob the question. It actually poses a whole set of questions. Um, so all these comments about moving forward with the work is because you guys have done that. You've both created your own methodology for thinking through these issues, and then you've, you've put out there a, a set of design questions and public policy questions, et cetera which to me is exactly what a degree project should do. It should never really solve anything. There's no period on the end of degree project. So in that respect, it's an ellipsis and it's amazing as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Thanks guys. Yeah. <laughs> I love this virtual clap. This is yeah. a new one. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's cute cards. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I just, uh, just heard Karen, I, almost, I lost her on my screen, the Brady Bunch thing. Oh, there you are, Karen. Hey. Hey, John. Um, so, uh, yeah, I didn't get a chance to weigh in on the, the, the presentation. I still want to know how you guys pulled off the, uh, uh, the figure pulling out the portion of the model that looked like a beautiful kind of merging of live action video and CG. And uh, that was, I just want to echo my enthusiasm for the quality of that presentation. It was, it was very, very remarkable. 
Um, so I guess we're going to kind of segue really quickly um, into the um, uh, final project for the morning session here. Um, uh, my name is John. Uh, I co-teach with Karen Bowsman, who uh, was speaking just a moment ago, uh, very eloquently about that last project. And we taught a section along with Saul Anton, who is our HMS faculty, who is lurking somewhere in chat, I saw. Um, uh, he's also again, he's on my screen as well. Um, a, a very brief introduction to our section. Um, you know, uh, Karen and I have been uh, teaching a section now for, I guess it's the sixth year, um, uh, that is dedicated toward the idea of what we believe to be the baseline of architectural um, expression and advocacy, which is form. Um, a rather simple question but with a lot of complex answers, as everybody knows. Um, we uh, tout our section as a somewhat open format. Uh, all projects, have, uh, all students pick their own sites, um, pick their own programs, and do a certain degree of kind of research in order to kind of engage a cultural issue, not necessarily solve any problems um, per se, uh, other than maybe the kind of practical ones related to program. In hopes that we demonstrate how um, uh, a student's uh, or an author's or an architect's um, formal predilections um, could be translated into a powerful form of advocacy when it comes to the issues that you know, buildings engage on a daily basis. So it's a, it's a, it's a fairly broad agenda. Uh, it's meant to create plenty of option for all the students to um, bring their um, uh, expertise to the table, their, their burgeoning expertise, uh, and uh, also demonstrate how a, uh, a visionary practice can be and probably should be founded on you know, one's own kind of sense of composition and uh, um, uh, spatial uh, um, craft um, such that, uh, you know, a practice kind of evolves along very organic lines and gains strength through thinking through making. Uh, so our, our course has the kind of the standard kind of intellectual components in terms of uh, writing and research. Um, but it also contains a, uh, a very special moment in the semester where the students are encouraged to experiment with form making in the most abstract sense in hopes that we might find something remarkable to deploy within the context that they've been working with. Um, this term has been particularly challenging because that typically happens in a physical format. And as everybody knows, there's not a lot physical about the format we found ourselves at the end of the term. However, we feel like our students really go to the occasion. And I think you'll see some snippets of that uh, uh, physical activity that, that uh, characterized the first part of the term here in today's presentation. Professor Bowsman, I, I just want to uh, I just want to add that the title of our studio is the Contem the architectural object in contemporary society, um, and so you'll be seeing a project predicated on that that very title. And in the open format, the students begin the fall semester uh, just for clarification with they define their own site their own program and their own material culture. So Brian and Max, you guys want to take it away? Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, our project is named after Echo of the Jungle and I'm Brian. Uh, and I, Max. So, since the Edo period, Asakusa of Japan has been people's designated place for get gathering in forms of religion and leisure. The long history of pilgrimage to Sensoji Temple with surrounding markets and theater street built the rich foundation of culture in Asakusa. Uh, in recent years, tourism began to gain more dominance in Japanese economy and business structure. The local neighborhoods have gradually turned into a repetitive streets that contain similar chain restaurant and shops and fully dedicate themselves to tourism. Uh, as the premium land value chase out the middle class, the craftsman's affordability because of the tourism, uh, the fragmentation of the old neighborhood began, began to shift and formalize the urban fabric of the current Asakusa area. Uh, Fading of the traditional Japanese culture is the bitter side of the econo uh, economic growth by, uh, brought by the tourism. While one foot is stuck in the reminiscence of the uh, old culture uh, and the other foot stuck in the sweet results of the economic improvement, uh, how should the city progress without losing one another? Um, 
in considering our site uh, and an approach of embracing the fading of traditional culture for the memories of the neighborhood would complement the site historical transformation because monument, uh, monumentalizing the past without sacrificing the city productivity and the means of uh, the econ e economy is the right way to move on. From our previous research on imperfection in relation to architecture's conventional value, perfection is based on the construct of permanence, but in the practice of wabi-sabi taught by Seno Rikyu, the master of Japanese tea ceremony, believe in that perfection exists in the form of self-awareness and the peaceful relationship among all things and people. In this hero, people will, uh, people's sense will be sharpened and start to be aware of how every single move of theirs will affect others due to the intentional tie spacing and therefore creates a harmonious relationship with the others. One second. Sorry, um, there's a technical issue here. Sorry for that. Um, the formal study further investigates the question of whether what is more suitable spacing, uh, spatial spacing in a volumetric sequence. By unfolding the traditional Japanese tatami arrangement, we began to discover the suitable ratio that's applicable for programs while capturing factor sensibility that exists in the site. By translating the constant fluctuation of the solid and void in various scales allows us to recreate a programmatic mediator that reflects the same condition that the site presents. The folded plate becomes a means to further investigate tectonic systems as well as the divisions of space and programs. The architecture resides within the form of a camouflaged map of folds, creating a highly privatized yet open atmosphere that dissolved into the neighborhood. Identification and application for a specific mediator demonstrated the, uh, how the open-ended system functions. Uh, shifting horizontally and vertically creates programmatic gaps that feels like void weaving through the dense urban space of Asakusa uh, is better to spit, stitch back to the uh, fracture sensibility back to the site. So the four main programs distributed across the project is a theater, uh, can, a collab, uh, collection of workshops, gallery, and artist residence. Workshop, workshops function as a vertical stacks of um, collective building channels where any level of the gallery can always lead them back here for some crafting experience. As a more detailed layout, beginning from the second floor, we have a, a, a dedicated workshop towards the, the, the experience of indigo dyeing, which is a traditional uh, craft that Japanese has been doing for, for a long time. And, so, and above, you have another workshop that's uh, designed for the experience of um, making lacquers. On top of that, there's, a, there's another workshop that's focused on um, practicing the blacksmith, which is uh, swords forging and um, steelwork manufacturers. So, Sequence of spatial continuity across all highlighted building chunks expresses the relation on eastern and western ends. In contrast with other corners of the building that matches the reading of surrounding urban fabric, the entrance of the northern gallery expresses the culture center's welcoming gestures to all. And the southern entrance for the privatized program maintains an overall gesture that matches the micro atmosphere of the neighborhood. So uh, upon uh, the arrival through our grand entry, um, the visitor would find themselves self-oriented along the visiting paths of the galleries. Uh, the organization of the northern section, uh, which in this plan is the left in part, uh, of the building follows a strict designated path with the focus for visitor to pass through levels of gallery with a rewarding experience uh, of different crafting trials. Uh, craftsman residency and, and rather privatized office spaces are located towards the more of a thousand part of the project, where these programs play as uh, small parts that attempt to camouflage into the site architecturally. 
Um, the consistent appearance of opening and closure allows occupants to experience the harmonious balance between the building spaces and the surrounding contacts of the site. Various punctures throughout the experience provides a level of uh, por porosity uh, where the visual connection between the programs uh, reminds visitors of their self-awareness while not disrupting the privatized experience. In contrast with the site, the material usage of the facade conveys a reading of serene and meditative qualities that also covers across the building design. Through our proposal of a cultural center as an institutional facility that memori memorialized the faded traditional culture, the gathering of learning traditional crafts through our workshops and showcasing archive artesian work done by past, past generations of craftsmen is a grand celebration and reassertion of the culture authenticity that the neighborhood once owned and also remind the city to move on without losing its roots. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, if I've got to unmute anybody, but uh, just hand it to the jury now for comments. Actually, I'm not sure I have control to unmute anybody, so. Uh, maybe I'll jump in with, oh. I, I just, I just want to say, I really appreciate the prompt as it was um, presented by uh, John, I think very often current pedagogy seems to exclude formalism as a valuable avenue towards, you know, uh, towards research. So I, I think it's interesting to take, to take that as a precondition of the work that we see. Um, I guess my question really on a very dumb level is, and, and, and I understand, and I, I would agree with the sentiment that a, a good thesis asks more questions than it answers, but on some level, it should also um, have a problem that it's trying to solve. And I, I guess I wonder to the, to the designers of this, what is it that led you to marrying the formal technique of these kind of simple planes in their permutations and the material um, logics that go behind them with this site in Japan and the, let's say the program specificity of a it seems like a residency cultural center so i wonder where the thinking is for that as a kind of confluence of the form and the program and the cultural conditions um the cultural condition is we we started by researching on the kind of diversity of, of japanese craft and and also studying how these um these crafts has been faded out of the out of the neighborhood. I mean, for the for the for the past decades, and and so so from that we kind of wanted um, to kind of recapture that that method, not necessarily the term methodology, but but the craft in in a, in a celebrative way, and but the the form actually derived from this kind of. Um, Fragment, fragment, fragmented urban, you know, um, the urban, urban so, fabric shape of the, the, the site, and and kind of to, to answer your question, that's that's kind of the the roots of, of these two elements, but the overall building um, forms still um, came from the our formal study, which kind of uh, it plays a lot of the ideas of um, offsetting and, and shifting in, in, in the spatial sequence that kind of, that has the same um, sensibility that the site offers. So in, in, in these two, two um, models that we did previously, on the left, one that explores how a form can have a different relationship in terms of field condition with one another. 
but once once the, once the kind of form is translated to a, a bigger scale, and and, and be read and be read as one individual, then it had it begins it begins to offering a different kind of um, readings and and materiality or its internal relation between the the, the spaces and, and the voice within each one of them. I mean, I, I guess I just asked that because there's a radical potential to what you put on the table. And the way I read it, you know, as I perused the documents before hearing the, the presentation was that this was somewhat of a way to reclaim a part of a fading cultural condition of these kind of shops and the craft work that goes into it, but also um, an urban tactic for uh, urban infill, right, that, that retains some resonance with the kind of cultural image aesthetic historical kind of precedents that I, I think you connect into quite well, but also provides a tectonic material sensibility that's rapidly deployable because, you know, it seems like you're working with a kit of parts of concrete, of channel, fluted glass, of um, wood. And to say that, you know, this could be a model for urban revitalization as a way to bring back and save those crafts or provide sites of culture. So I, I think that's what I'm reading in the project is the kind of radical potential of it as a, as a larger, which, which I think uh, um, alleviates the concern a little bit about program specificity. Like, I, I don't think this conversation will necessarily revolve around how successful this is as a gallery space or, or those things. But I think it just evinces that this formal strategy through its permutations, through its material, tectonics and logics can produce a range of programmatic solutions that, you know, could be um, atomized and reconfigured per the districts that one would uh, insert them into. So I, I think it, it's very provocative from this point of, point of view. So congratulations on, on a great uh, um, series of images and, uh, and a project that reflects that thinking. I mean, perhaps, yeah, I'll just kind of um, jump in after that. You know, what I, what I love about uh, what you guys are proposing here is you're, you're thinking syntactically, um, but in an interesting way, very sectionally, you're thinking. Um, you know, it's not a planned project um, in any way. And you, you've kind of come up with this kind of really beautiful uh, set of um, elements that you can imagine could take over um, a, a site like it has um, in kind of a, a non-traditional way, um, kind of finding ways to kind of move up vertically and then, you know, kind of uh, meander around or graft around um, the existing uh, kind of urban um, geometry, which is really interesting. You know, the, the only thing I'm kind of curious about here is um, how could you use that, you know, as a kind of a, a pure sequence, but um, as a way that you could potentially um, build connections through some of these reveals. So, so you, you, you're operating this beautiful sequence, um, but I wonder how you kind of bring those, bring two discrete spaces together that are very intimate. Um, and, and also you might even allow us to um, anticipate something else um, that's coming or that we could, um, uh, I don't know, uh, yearn for as we go through this uh, kind of labyrinthian situation. It's, it's a really interesting, I think, strategy for um, kind of urban infill. It's, it has a lot of potential, but yeah, I wonder how you can go into the adjacencies through some of those, those, those slits. And also, I guess, um, how you reveal something, something else in the end, um, like could this, could this, um, you know, lend itself to, you know, a, an earth room or, a, you know, like a, a rooftop space where we could, you know, have a chance to kind of reflect on how we moved through the city in a different way. Um, so I don't know, just just things to think about, but it's kind of a, a really interesting idea for uh, being sensitive to this, this neighborhood and the craft. And, you know, I also wonder about that, like how can the, the showcasing of these kind of, um, uh, beautiful craftsmen play a role in the space as well, or maybe in the, in the material um, that, you know, it's, it's not just, say, uh, a, a craftsman's workshop and a gallery, but 
you get an opportunity to see their work, um, you know, is integrated in, into part of the building material or, you know, so something like that. So there's even more of an exchange um, and uh, uh, kind of um, an awareness that gets built as we go through this. Um, maybe, sorry, one more thing I was gonna say, it, because it's so sequential, it would be beautiful, I think, if you know, if there's like a an, an animation or something where we could we could watch the sequence through a day, or you know, see how the sequence changes at night. Um, you know, it's uh, for yourself. I would think about how how to tell that story even even better. And this could be something you work on in the summer, but it's a kind of a, a beautiful speculative project. Um, thank you. Thank you. I like the explanation. I like the exploration and manipulation of the kit of parts to a a final composition. Especially now, I'm looking at what's on your screen, but go into the perspective views within the courthouse, within the courtyards. Uh, more, more. Yeah, this things like happen. this that enable me to have this sense of walking through and what is opaque, what is translucent and what is transparent um, and how this pulls apart. Tokyo being incredibly, incredibly dense. And I find this interesting of coming through a spine that one can walk through and have it not as dense as the typical street. Um, and I'm seeing things being pulled apart. I find this, spatially, I find this interesting. And all, of, all coming from the kit of parts and your, and your manipulation of that kit of parts. This I find interesting because of a previous project and it was mentioned, I'm gonna set up a, um, a project where it's gonna raise questions. Here, you set up a project where you almost come up with an answer. Uh, you come up with an equation and you come up with an answer for a jury to evaluate. Hey, I, I think I want to pick up on the comment about syntax. Um, so I was thinking about in your presentation, the, uh, the observation you made that perfection, uh, perfection can exist in self-awareness, um, which in an interesting way is not necessarily uh, perfection in the world objectively, but perfection in a relationship between something in the world objectively and a perceiving body or a perceiving entity, <clears throat> presumably a, a human or, or humans in general. And you showed an image of a threshold experience with the foot, the stone. Um, so the implication there is that your design is gonna provoke that, that self-awareness. Um, then the question becomes formally what uh, you know, what move is necessary to make that happen? Um, and in John's introduction, he was talking about the thinking through making question, which um, to me is a clue that indicates that um, you iterate a tremendous amount to test, but the iteration doesn't result in a single final product. It's actually a, a cumulative um, process and thinking takes place across that entire process. Um, you know, a, a kind of a line came to mind uh, while you were presenting. I was thinking uh, almost nothing, almost nothing. Um, and I was thinking about minimalism and I was thinking about Mies, et cetera, et cetera. But then I was thinking, well, almost nothing is almost enough. Um, and formal iteration, the end product of formal iteration is almost enough, but the entire process is enough. Uh, and that got me to thinking about SCARPA and an experience I had. I think, Danny, I, I might have told you this story, but when Carla and I were in Venice some years ago, it wasn't just um, more recently, but it was a while ago, we went to the gate of the, uh, of the school, the IUAV, and kind of climbed around on it. And, of course, it was 
my first experience seeing Scarpa in the flesh. So it was a huge thing for me. Um, really, really important. Um, and that whole trip, you know, going to the cemetery, et cetera, and wandering around Venice, um, going to Castelvecchio. But the uh, experience at the gate was maybe one of the most important ones because there were a bunch of kids who also climbed up on the gate. And um, there were all these young girls who literally were the kind of um, manifest of Scarpa's margin notes sketches, which Delco talks about um, in, his, uh, in his monograph on Scarpa, you know, that, that Scarpa's way of drawing was a process of thinking and it was thinking through making. And John, you, you might be familiar with this. Um, Scarpa, the point that Delco makes about Scarpa is his specific relationship to orthogonal drawing versus perspectival drawing and the way that he thinks very precisely in those terms in orthogonal versus perspectival drawing. Um, and he makes an argument that a certain kind of objectivity is achieved through the orthogonal drawing. Um, but then again, you see this kind of interesting, almost unconscious subconscious stream of, um, of thinking taking place in the margins and these kind of partially spectral ghost-like spirit figures that inhabit um, Scarpa's drawings. And so for me, it was this incredibly uh, cathartic moment to be sitting on the top of the gate after having climbed up on it and being surrounded by these kids who are also climbing up on the gate and playing. Um, of course, it's personal and I'm assigning meaning to it, but maybe this is a, a way to talk about syntax because syntax is basically um, a, sy a systematic formalism that produces meaning. Um, now, it's gonna be up to us to kind of argue about what meaning is because you might argue, well, meaning is meaning, or you might argue that meaning is contingent and can only, only be achieved as John pointed out by thinking through making and not in the end product, but by the process. And so meaning isn't the end product, but it's the process. And then it's a, a compression decompression process on the end of us as users experiencing the drawings or experiencing the building, experiencing the space and reconstructing meaning, not in one moment, but over time. And so another thing that I, I was wondering as you, as you two presented was how quickly should self-awareness be accomplished? You know, like you show the threshold moment. And for me, the threshold moment sitting on Scarpa's gate was really important because it, it was this kind of um, revelation moment of linking back across two decades or more of me dealing with Scarpa, but then finally being at Scarpa's work for the first time, but remembering reading and studying Scarpa back in the 90s and connecting that observation from Delco's writing about Scarpa to Scarpa's drawings to me sitting there. And so it was this kind of folding of time back and on top of itself over and over again, like a kind of implication. And so I wondered, you know, how quickly should the self-awareness that you're talking about be accomplished? Is it this moment where you cross the threshold and you're like, whoa, revelation? Um, or is it that you cross, you cross the threshold when you're 40 years old or you cross the threshold when you're 70 years old? Um, or maybe you cross the threshold thousands of times and you're not even ever really aware, but by the end of a life, you've accumulated awareness, even though you might not be aware that you're aware, right? And you know, it's the kind of Benjaminian absent-minded examination of space where you, you embody thinking, even though you're not entirely aware that you're perceiving and thinking. And so for me, that it seems to me that that's a very, very important hinge point in your project is if you're articulating this, um, like, um, well, to borrow again, the, the, the comments about syntax, if you're articulating a syntax, um, and then it leads to a thinking through making, as John pointed out, does the thinking end up with a revelatory moment, like a flash, or does it kind of build in intensity? Um, or does it just ring for a very, very long time? You know, like a, like a bowl that is set to vibrate and then it rings for a long time until it fades out. And I feel like that's a, that's a very, very important aspect to your project. You know, um, for me, Scarpa, again, I mentioned him a, a few times today. Um, I don't know why that came to mind, but it, it just came up um, today very strongly for me. Scarpa was someone who thought about this in, in a very, very beautiful way. Uh, and so if you haven't immersed yourself in Scarpa's work, it might be a nice um, sidetrack to go through in relationship to this question, uh, the tension between reflection, imperfection, perfection, and self-awareness. 
Evan just brought up the, uh, the Talmud in the chat. I think that Scarpa and the Talmud actually have a lot of resonance with each other because Scarpa, it's interesting, you brought up Time Ed. And, you know, Scarpa, I've always been very envious of the idea that he basically lived on a lot of the sites that he was designing, like with Brion, for instance. He had the time to really drink in the site, right? And, and really immersed himself in it in ways that maybe we all wish we could when we were designing projects. He was able, and I'll use a bar from the formal language of, of your project, right? Where you're folding and unfolding these formal kinds of uh, projections and spaces, right? In order to achieve um, the form that you've, come, that you've come out with. And I think the Talmud is, is very much, again, much like Scarpa, a, a, a text where there's commentaries on the commentaries on the commentaries, there's this folding and unfolding of the text. Time is kind of, it, the, the commentaries are building on each other, right? Time is kind of lost, but at the end of the day, you can sit in front of this, these volumes and you kind of see, you can, your eyes go around the page and you can see all the different texts and kind of make all the connections. Similarly in a Scarpa project, it, you can also see these different references and allusions to time, um, various different um, influences that he had and also hopefully the time that he spent on the site as well. So I think it's interesting to kind of think about that when it comes to a, a formal language like you all are proposing, um, because yeah, what is the time scale? I think that's a beautiful way to put it, Ed. What is the time scale that one needs when they're bringing up all these ghosts of the city to reinsert them back into the city, right? I mean, can you just plop them back in? There is no craftsman anymore. Do we, we put them back into this area? Or do you really need to spend the time there over, over a prolonged amount of time to really understand that? Yeah, I'm with this question of the exterior. You guys mind taking us maybe to some exterior images we do this? I don't, I don't want to interrupt the train of thought here, but it might be helpful to kind of see this in the context of the city. Forgive me, Eric. Sorry about that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm just going Eric, there was this comment that you made in the discussion. Um, you, you were asking, can a formal language be introduced as a civic plugin to restore what cities destroy at times of growth? And um, that's, a really, that's a really, really interesting question because um, I think um, also in the thread, Claire picked this up vis-a-vis -vis Ando's um, Mall Along the River in Kyoto. Yeah, I was going to try and answer that question. Yeah, please. In that, that's sort of what I found inspiring about the project is that the precedents that were in my head when I looked at this reminded me about some of the things that in, a, in effect were responding to that provocation, which is can a made formal language that has integrity to itself actually ultimately be highly contextual. And I really like these exterior images, I think really support both that question and this idea that a um, this intervention, this language can be a reading unto itself, which is I, I think whether it's Talmud or the other book analogies are getting to the integrity of a structure that's like a book. Uh, which is not necessarily structures we, or like Scarpa or like other presence in architecture, but not like commercial architecture. So when I look at this, I think of the reinvention, even um, the, um, there's another, I can't even remember the famous fashion company that did, they came over here too, it wasn't an opening ceremony, but a London company that did a, mall or retail, it was almost like a vertical. Um, it's in, I'm pretty sure there's one in Tokyo, but it was like a reinvention of the idea of wandering through a store without doors and without departments and just inhabiting the structure of a store. And in a sense, I feel like when you look at your program of these craftsmen, and it's not about interfering with a craftsman space, but it is about this urban question. If you put something that has a strong architectonic integrity, does it actually support the context better 
than mimicking what's already there. And I think that's what I find really inspiring about your subject matter, but also just what you're getting us all to talk about. I wish I had a lot more to add than what has already been said. I think there's a lot of uh, really great things that have been said, but I guess I, I can maybe try to chime in with a little bit of a question that might open this up in a slightly different direction. Um, I think what I'm hearing in the conversation is that there's a tremendous sort of um, resolution of form and function. You've achieved a kind of highly crafted urban condition that has the qualities of the traditional Japanese crafts you want to preserve on some level, and yet is modern architecture writ large, both at the level of scale and the sort of multiplicity of scales that you've achieved. By the way, as an aside, I think your one of the tremendous achievements here is that um, this works at so many different scales and integrates them in a really lovely way. But, but the question I have on some level comes back to kind of one of the early questions you guys posed at the beginning of the year um, regarding wabi-sabi, which is this kind of aesthetic of imperfection. In some level, <clears throat> there's, there's too much perfection here. Um, this equation ultimately really works out. And I'm wondering um, if there's a role for something imperfect, something irrational, something broken here. I think that um, uh, I think what, what, you, what you just said about the perfected um, appearance of the project is isn't the focus of, of our previous study because we understood that the the idea of perceiving something that is perfected we analyze as our as kind of like people's um, construct of how they how the, the value of the architecture is often tied to the conventional um, idea that it has to be permanent, it has to be good. But what we are um, questioning is more about the kind of internal, how should I say, the, the kind of internal relationship of how people occupying the space. So if we go back to plan that, this kind of goes back into our original um, programmatic study in terms of how we arrange things. So instead of the most con the most conventional way of people design is trying to make things that's convenient, is easy um, accessing from different points, but instead we focus on how to reassure that the occupants will get the opportunity to experience what we wanted to offer at the expense of um, sacrificing some, some type of um, conventional convenience to, ach to achieve that goal. So the perfection isn't about how the, um, how the building is expressed in the materiality of it, but it's, it's more on the level of um, idea that how to construct a perfect experience for the, for the people. Well, it may be that we uh, find ourselves at the conclusion of a very rich conversation. Um, I have to say, I, um, uh, I, I think I'd give Edward just one last opportunity. You never know when somebody might be having a technical issue or just on mute or talking to a, uh, a dead mic. But uh, anyhow, um, assuming everybody can still hear me. 
uh, you know, I want to affect it. I, uh, uh, yeah, I just want to point out a couple of things um, really quick here in, in conclusion um, and also run the risk maybe of reinvigorating the conversation. And that, um, uh, 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 Professor uh, Khalili's opening commentary there about um, you know, the, the nature of the formal system in this case, I thought was an interesting one. I think it also led to some, some very insightful, you know, um, discussion about how the pedagogy kind of engages with the project in a larger case, in a larger sense. One of the reasons why uh, we had um, uh, chosen this project to showcase partially because the students were very accomplished and the documentation was so rich, but um, also because the sense that, you know, a formally based agenda um, or at least we feel like this group demonstrated that formally based agenda doesn't necessarily equate to the kind of hyper legibility associated with buildings that are often condemned to the realm of formalism um, as a label. And, um, you know, one of the beautiful things about uh, this project that seen expressed by the team earlier is that you know, the sense that, um, you know, Tokyo's general kind of exuberance and, and the kind of illegibility of the, of the urban landscape in Tokyo is part of its richness might become the working model for a cultural center um, suggested to us that there's also another powerful message here that, you know, a project that has a strong formal predilection doesn't necessarily need to take on an explicit um, degree of monumentality to uh, offer a, a clear cultural statement. Um, now, the building itself might lack clarity, but it does so in a poignant way, we felt. Um, and the beauty of its complexity was something that we felt really needed to be showcased here in this forum. So we uh, thank uh, Brian and Max for their hard work on that front. And I think they did a wonderful job of, of um, you know, bringing a real sense of the, the city to bear on their project. I also I appreciated the fact that their, uh, their architectural expression uh, allowed for a sort of uh, camouflage character, so or chameleon, I mean, uh, where upon their architecture uh, was um, uh, illuminated the surrounding density of that area of Tokyo and all of its complexities, uh, the intense lighting, the filigree of all the surfaces uh, in that area, uh, the intense commercial um, uh, retail aspect of that area and so it was all sort of reflected back onto their architecture because the architecture was in a sense quiet dignified um and sort of was a a, a good foil for the kind of cacophony that happens around the site i, I I'm, I'm gonna weigh in sorry i didn't previously you were you did effectively restart the conversation john i've just it's very interesting looking at this project in contrast to the previous project um, and this idea of these in between the, the kind of marginal, the, the word marginalia um, being used to talk about it and obviously radically different approaches. Um, Alex was making a provocation about, you know, what would the kind of control or management systems here be in contrast to the previous project. Um, but thinking about these as new, um, new forms of urbanism is very interesting to me. And I have to congratulate um, the students on like, just an extreme restraint here um, that there's something which is like the, the level of thoughtfulness here is really uh, wonderful. And you're not trying to, you know, and as John, you're pointing out, you, you start off uh, with the premise of thinking through making and, and, and dealing in a very explicit way with form. And for me to see the kind of um, really uh, elegant simplicity with which this has been articulated, the system itself wants to go and be in a lot of other places too, uh, uh, to be considered in this way, these kind of non-sites or um, non-places as um, we were calling them in the previous project. And if the marginalia idea is exciting to you, there's like a whole collection in the New York Public Library. It's a secret little trove. I don't know if anyone's ever, Ed is, Ed is raising his eyebrows, so I'm guessing he's also spent an afternoon with it, but you can go in there basically and it's a, it's a private collection. I haven't been forever, so hopefully it's still, I, I, it's one of those things I think it's probably in perpetuity, but it's a lot of famous writers uh, collect their books with their marginalia. So, um, and then, and then, you know, so you're looking at their copy of, uh, 
you know, uh, a famous novel that has all of their marginal notes in it. Um, and, and there's some really wonderful discoveries in there as a kind of launching pad for how you might begin to think about this. So I, I just want to applaud you on, on this really wonderful project. Yeah, I love that co comment um, about the marginalia. I mean, for some reason, I, I think I, this is really, really strange, but for some reason, um, you know, taking all the comments into consideration and this, this charge of the imperfection and the perfection, um, I strangely think of uh, the installation at the YAP um, PS1 MoMA uh, that was done by CODA, uh, Carolina O'Donnell, um, where she kind of used material that was left over from making skateboards, essentially. So, you know, the, the whole construction was, you know, made from this um, leftover material. Um, and I think, you know, when you're we're speaking about craftsmen and making, um, there's a lot of um, kind of um, excess that gets created when you make things, um, things that are imperfect or things that are, you know, not quite right. Um, so I wonder how you take into account like the, the two sides of production there, um, the production that might, might be the perfect and the displayed and it's about craft, but you know, then all the, the other side of, of craftsman's work, which is, you know, usually have a lot of um, you know, you know, things that are left over from your process. Um, and I wonder how you could think about that through the sequence. Like it could be that, um, you know, and this maybe speaks to, to Ed's, um, Ed's comment about uh, how you're changed from this in some way, um, that you might go through this space as it's intended to you know, clean and it's a meditation. Um, but if you were to go back the other way, the inverted way, uh, you might see something else, right? Like you might see the other side of production, the messiness of production. Um, and that could be something that it does exist between, um, you know, the margins or is in the margins um, in the gap, but you have to kind of move through the space once and then move back, you know, the other way to see this kind of alternate side of um, the craftsmen that you're trying to show showcase. So um, it could be the, again, I, I feel like that would, could be done in representation somehow, um, but it's a it's a beautiful project, and you know it it warrants for you to continue to develop this. Um, but it's yeah, thank you Danielle, for this. Yeah. Yeah, Danielle, I want to say it's a brilliant comment. If you saw their desk when we were actually in studio, <laughs> the cacophony of production uh, to get this minimalist, uh, um, transcendent architecture uh, was a sight to behold. What I, uh, and this is a compliment to the writing instructors as well as to the uh, two students. It is well, it has got a wonderful vocabulary which has been edited well. It is punctuated well. Um, and I'm gonna say presented well and intriguing. So uh, congratulations, thank you very much. It, it follows a formal language that goes through and that's meant as a compliment. This is our, uh, this was our, uh, this was our first uh, semester working with uh, um, Professor Anton and the ensemble uh, deserves a lot of credit. Um, for assisting us in that respect, and you did a wonderful job. Um, and just, yeah, you know, I'll take this moment to say this publicly, and I'll probably say it again this afternoon, that uh, um, the uh, uh, his background in art criticism uh, and uh, doing editorial work within the uh, the arts industry is invaluable, um, uh, especially uh, considering our traditional point of departure for this class was the, kind of the tattered end of uh, of. Uh, uh, formalist criticism in, uh, in the arts and literism, and um, it was wonderful working with him this term. So I just want to take a moment to publicly thank him for all of his efforts uh, this term. Yes, all. It was fabulous, and I felt as if I was one of your uh, students as well. Well, thank you. Um, I learned a lot from you guys and from all the students this semester, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, it's been really uh, enjoyable to see the development of the work 
and to participate in that. Now, honestly, I really this is a tremendous amount of work, but it's really very satisfying as far as um, a teaching experience goes. So thank you to both of you and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Mac. And conclude our morning session. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just take a moment to thank our jury. I, you know, this is always a, uh, uh, a humbling moment um, within the course of the term where you know we have a chance to kind of see our peers, uh, you know, in some form or other, and, and uh, you know, get some unexpected perspectives on the work that always you know causes me to think, well, gosh, there's so many other rocks we could be unturning. <laughs> And uh, you know, I hope that all the students today will um, you know, take that as a uh, essentially a prompt um, you know, to continue to, to work with these important ideas that are being thrown down. Um, it's been a really rich discussion. It's always a little intimidating. I have to kind of look at it, and keep track of the visual thing, and see see all the interesting things that are happening in chat as well. Um, hopefully, this will be one of the things that carries over once we emerge from this uh, current situation with the uh, notion that. You know, these conversations can be as multivalent and as rich as this will we'll, 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 uh, we'll continue. Yeah, it's been so satisfying to hear from all of you and to see all of you and have that uh, call and response across the work. It's just been such a benefit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, everybody. See you in the afternoon. Thank you. See you in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, folks. Bye. And do you mind staying here? Farzan, was that you? Oh yeah, that was me. I was asking Anne to uh, yes. wait, wait for a minute and speak to me. Uh, Ed, I'm the thank host. You so much. Uh, Ed, <laughs> I just want to say uh, thank you for accepting to to join us, and I, I feel very lucky that Jason actually did put you on our review. So, oh, it was I, such I, a pleasure, and Farzan, thank you so much. It was really great. Uh, and uh, Ed was my 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 professor at GSAP his last semester, and you know I went to GSAP. Ed, I don't, I think Ed believes me finally. I, I went to GSAP because of Ed, and you know it was a gamble to do that because you know it's a lottery system and you know luckily I got Ed I, I never did gave the studio the amount of time and effort it needed um, for various reasons but you know hopefully one day I will you know uh, give uh, you know do, do the due diligence and you know uh, give back everything that uh, gave uh, taught me uh, I think I, you, taught you already me. have for us him you already have my man I owe you for life thank you so thank much you. Thank you so much. You're a role uh, model to all of us. Thank you. Uh, wait, a great pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Amazing work. Thank also. You. No, too bad we can all have drinks after this in person. Oh man, I so much hope so. <laughs> yeah, we're all going crazy. Uh, yeah. Anyway, see you guys in uh, in an hour. See you. Thank you so much. See yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao, Bye-bye. folks. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Thank you. Hi. Hey, thank you so much. Can I turn thank off you. recording now? Yes. Stop. Yeah. I did it. Thank you, Ty. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Always enjoy these things. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very I don't much. Know you, you never, you never saw me, but you know, I worked at Perkins Eastman, uh, you know, uh, for a, for a brief period. You know, I would always see you in the mo early mornings, but you know. When? I worked there in 2012. <laughs> I think that Brad Perkins remembers me from 1978. That's amazing. That's great. Which yeah. is incredibly long. Yes. Anyway, hey, thanks a lot. It's always Thank enjoyable you, to do this. Lovely to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Good Thank enough. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Farzan, do I also um, go to the YouTubes and stop it?